Moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Carlson. Carlson. Vieira. Maniscalco. Pertec. Here. Goo. Here. Miranda. Here. And Citro. Here. We have a physical form. Thank you. Mr. Massey. Uh, good morning. This is the uh, July 16, 2022 regular meeting of the City of Tampa City Council uh, meeting uh, held in City Council Chambers on the third floor of Old City Hall, 315 East Kennedy Boulevard here in Tampa, Florida at 9 a.m. The public is able to attend this meeting in person or view it via cable television on Spectrum Channel 640 or Frontier Channel 15 or by the internet via www.tampa.gov slash livestream. The public is also able to participate in this meeting during public comment for a maximum of three minutes per speaker, either here in person in city council chambers or virtually by way of communication, media technology or CMT. However, the use of CMT does not require, does require, excuse me, pre-registration with the city clerk's office. Directions for pre-registration are included in the notice of the meeting and on the agenda. Members of the public may also participate in public hearings and quasi-judicial matters remotely using CMT, but cell phones and smartphones are not compatible for use in quasi-judicial hearings as they will not allow your camera when connected. You must have access to a CMT device such as a tablet, or computer equipped with a camera and a microphone that will enable you to be seen and heard by city council and, other, and all other participants in a quasi-judicial matter. Uh, finally, per the memorandum from the chair, the order of business for city council meetings uh, is, uh, is changed to move staff reports and unfinished business to take place immediately after request by the public for reconsideration of legislative items. Uh, could I have a motion waiving the city council standard rules for procedures allowing public comment by CMT? <coughs> motion made by Councilman Calico, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. I believe there are a number of changes to the agenda if yes. you want to go through those now. Going through our agenda right now, I believe the first one is item number 12 will be heard under staff reports. All in favor say aye. aye. Motion made by Councilman Mascotko, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, I believe 27 is being asked to be continued to <laughs> July 14th. We do need a time certain for that, 10.30 a.m. 10.30? Have second. a motion made by Councilman Goose, seconded oh, by second. Councilman Miranda. Celine, do you have? Yeah. Motion made by Councilman Goose, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. aye. <coughs> Again, we have item 41, I believe it's the next one. Yes, moved to July 14th. Moved Ooh. item 41 to July 14th. Is that 1030? 1030. Uh, well, it would be under staff report. Staff report. Yes. Staff report. Staff report. <coughs> Motion made by Council Magoo, seconded by Council Mascato. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Is there any against? Thank you. Good. Item 48, remove that from today's agenda. We'll be coming forward with another resolution. So that's second. Second. later. A motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Man, uh, Miranda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Then under staff reports, there's a number of changes too. Do you want to go through yes, those now? Yes, I'm getting there right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, again, we'll be hearing number 12 under staff reports. <laughs> Items number 5960. And 68 and 69 will be moving till July 14th. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I make a request for 59, uh, being that it's the council attorney, can we move it to July 28th under staff reports? Because I know we have our break, and so at least there's time to get organized. Okay, let's go with that one. Well, 59 to July 28th. Do you want to move 60 to the 28th since that's a companion item to that, I believe? Surely, but, yes. Yeah. 
59 and 60 to July 20th. So move. Staff report. Motion made by Councilor Mascaca, second by Councilor Mancuso. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Then we will move 60 and 69 to the 14th of July. No, no, 60 was done. 68. Sorry. 59 and 69. Okay. 68 and 60. Yeah, 68 and 60. Yeah. Uh, 59 and 60. Okay. And 68 and 69 to July 14th. Thank you. Motion made by? Madison Scott. Madison Scott, seconded by uh, Hertat. All in favor say aye. Aye. July 14th. Mr. Massey, I believe that what there are uh, uh, 65 is going to be under July 14th staff. Report. Move to continue 65 uh, staff reports July 14th. Yes. I also believe that you have a memo for Councilman Carlson to uh, continue item 63 and 64. To, uh, Let's get through okay. with the 65 motion made by Councilman Goose, seconded by Councilman Mascott. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now I'm sorry, Mr. Massey. I believe we have a memo from Councilman Carlson regarding continuing item 63 and 64. It's well, 66, correct. Yeah, 63 is. Mr. Chair? Yes. 63 and 64, I would like to move to um, October, please. Um, how about October 20th? That's a great second. second. Time, sir? Mm -hmm. the chef. Can we make it 9, 9 a.m.? Let's make a staff report, please. Okay. Motion made by Councilman uh, uh, Carl Goose. Second. Sorry. 60. 60. 66. You also wanted to move, Councilman Carl? Yes, please. Um, can we move that one to um, uh, I think I was trying to move it to August. August 25th. Okay, thank you. Motion made by Councilman Carl. Seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Does that clear off our document? And do we do we uh, get deal a couple things? Uh, item 65. Did that get continued um, as well? Yes. Okay. The other thing, uh, one correction. I think we continued item 27. That shouldn't be continued. It um, it has to be set for a public hearing, um, uh, and that there will for July 14th at 10:30 a.m. Is that correct? Uh, 1030, yes, that's what we yeah. so, so it's not to continue, but it's to set a public hearing for July, for a public hearing on the matter. Right. It's not properly before you this morning because it wasn't set for a public hearing, I don't think. Okay, so we just moved it. Okay, we're good. All Did, right, that does clear off our- Mr. Chair. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, and I apologize, I'm a couple minutes late. Uh, number 68, I assume you moved already? Yes. I just wanted to say, um, it sounds like our attorney is coming back soon, but in the, in the event, we need a policy uh, in, in the event that that our attorney goes out. Um, that uh, and, and no offense to Mr. Massey because he's a great attorney and does a great job. But but we need to make sure until we change the charter, we need to make sure that the attorney representing city council represents city council and only city council. And, does and that's, like that's that. understood. If, if Mr. Uh, Shelby would have gone for any more extended time, I, I would have loved to okay. discuss this. So we'll wait until the. Uh, what is it, uh, the 14th? Correct. Yeah, and then when we go to change the charter, we need to make it clear because there is a, and I've talked to a lot of attorneys now related to the Florida Bar, there's a, there's an inherent conflict in the way it's set up. And uh, that creates. Motion made by Councilman Madagascar. One. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Before we begin, I'd just like to wish a very special happy birthday to Sue Ling, who's hey. right here with us. Item number one. Who's got that one? ATU. Yes. Okay, Mr. Goods. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of council. We have the pleasure this morning of the ATU. Uh, employee of the Month accommodation. 
Uh, Mr. Antoine Williams. Yes, sir. And Mr. Williams is out of the automotive uh, equipment operator. Yes, sir. So I guess Mr. Steve will tell us a little bit about that job description so we'll know what's going on and then I'll come back with the accommodation. Mr. Simons. Yes, sir. Thank you, Councilman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Council, and City of Tampa. I'm happy to be here today to introduce you to Mr. Antoine Williams, the ATU Employee of the Month of the month. <laughs> Antoine Williams is a very dedicated, hardworking employee. He began his career with the City of Tampa's Neighborhood Enhancement Division as part of the East Tampa CRA Summer Youth Program in 2017. As soon as he was eligible, he applied and was hired as a full-time employee in the department as a service attendant. Through hard work and continued dedication, he obtained his commercial driver's license and has been promoted to an automotive equipment operator one. Mr. Williams is a true success story on the benefits of investing in our youth programs and providing opportunities for growth and development. He is a great example for others and always has a positive message for the new round of summer youth that joined the program. He is a great asset to the team and to the city of Tampa. And now I would like to introduce Neighborhood and Community Affairs Administrator Osea Wynn to say a few words, please. Good morning, Council. It is with great pleasure that I stand before you this morning to present one member of our team of our unsung heroes. This is a team that you, you often you they're seen but not heard. Um, to really celebrate the program that we have from summer youth to a migration or triculation up, attrition up through our uh, city departments is, uh, goes without saying that it is an honor for me to have one of our employees to navigate through that process. So thank you so much for supporting it. Thank you, Antoine. And thank you for all of our neighborhood enhancement team members who are actually out there doing the work. They're doing the work, so thank you so much. And then I have Keith. Good morning, Council. Uh, Keith O'Connor, Neighborhood Enhancement Manager. I just wanted to reiterate uh, what administrator said. Uh, these are your true unsung heroes from up, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Start, oh, well, continue along the lines of the acknowledgement. to read it in part. Dear Antoine, congratulations on being selected as the Amalgamated Transit Union's Employee of the Month for your professionalism, strong work ethics, going above and beyond in all aspects in your position as an automotive equipment operator. You are an asset to the City of Tampa, the Neighborhood Enhancement Division, and to our community. Well respected, example others to it is employees like you, Antoine, that make me proud to serve as mayor. Thank you for your dedication and service. Sincerely, Mayor Jane. And also, on behalf of... Before I let Antoine speak, gentlemen, you know, uh, Mayor Castor sent the letter, but uh, no one can be more prouder than the person who represents District 5 and someone who had an opportunity to be a part of our youth program in this temple. That's why I always talk about that program is so viable and having young people to be a part of the process of the city to be able to have a summer job, work, get an opportunity to see what goes on in the city, and then get upward mobility to get a job within the city. Uh, that's what makes me so proud to say that you did it. Uh, I remember Sal told me the first time we did it, he says, we got a, a young man, he's going to be elevated, and that's why I'm so happy that we have these type of programs and want to enhance those programs for opportunities for those who may not have an opportunity. So uh, on behalf of Tampa City Council, in recognition of Antoine Williams, the ATU Employee of the Month, for your hard work and dedication as an automotive equipment operator uh, with the Neighborhood Enhancement Division. Antoine began his career with the City of Tampa Neighborhood Enhancement Division as a part-time uh, worker in East Tampa. You know, again, that just, that gives me chills when I hear that word, East Tampa has someone doing the right thing and moving in the right direction. Uh, this, the City, uh, city Council, uh, is proud to present this accommodation to Antoine, who exemplifies the type of employee who everyone admires, expects, and cheers to success. You're a great asset to the city of Tampa. And again, let me shake your hand. Thank you. 
for me, I'm very proud. You can tell my voice because yes, we had somebody who, who walked the walk and, and did it. Yes, so I appreciate you. Appreciate you. Want to talk? Yeah. Hey, I just want to say I'm big on, you know, appreciation. Giving somebody their flowers while, you know, they here. So I really appreciate this award. Getting recognized for my hard work. I just want to say thank you to Susan. She was always 100% behind me. I want to thank you to all my coworkers. They really taught me a lot. So this award for all of us, this award for the whole department. I really appreciate y'all. Council Donna McBride with the Strath Center. It's a great privilege to meet you, Mr. Williams. Thank you for all that you do for our community. The Strath Center would like for you to enjoy the show at your leisure and just give us a call when you're ready. Appreciate you. Thank you. How you doing? Good morning, Council. Mike MacArthur with Steps Towing Service on behalf of Todd Step and Steps Towing Service and and everybody on our team, we'd like to present you with a $50 gift card to Texas Roadhouse. Take some time off, go to dinner, and uh, appreciate everything you do for appreciate our community. You. Yep. Good morning, sir. How, How are you? Doing? Good, good. You work for Suze? Yes. You do, huh? Yes. I've known her for a while. <laughs> you know, and if she says that she's supporting you, you know, that's a big statement, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> On behalf of a couple of different folks, um, We'd like to recognize you and <clears throat> and provide you with some gift certificates so you can enjoy yourself. And uh, you, you might take Susie with you. <laughs> <clears throat> On behalf of the Chicho's Restaurant Group, we're providing you with a $50 gift certificate. You can enjoy yourself at one of their restaurants for okay. breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Okay, On behalf of the YMCA, and I fear you, you don't have time to go to the Y, but, but, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Okay. So you can go to the Y and enjoy yourself over there. And on behalf of Yummy House um, China Bistro, you can enjoy yourself over there. <clears throat> and then last but not least, uh, Bella Brava is providing you with a $50 gift certificate so you can enjoy yourself over there. So that's a lunch or dinner. So there's your letters. Here is your gift card. And here are your certificates for Bella Brava. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you for what you do. And uh, we appreciate you. And like I said, if Susie likes you, that's that's a big statement. Yeah. <laughs> Council members, Councilman Carls, thank you so much for everything you've done, um, and uh, and and thanks for all you're going to do in the future. We appreciate everything. Thank you. And uh, yes, sir, and I'd like to echo that. Thank you for everything you've done. What you do is very honorable work, and you're investing in, in young people's lives. And so you can, you know, look at your um, uh, time here and continuing here is, is just making that really critical investment. And it's been recognized by your peers, and that's a big deal. That doesn't come easily. So congratulations. All right, thank you. Congratulations, sir, on this recognition. Thank you for all your hard work, you and your entire team, the entire department, because you're out there tirelessly working hard and we appreciate you uh, from all of us up here and from the entire city of Tampa thank you um, I want to say thank you as well and I think it's amazing how you were able to start as a youth and then choose to just continue the path because city employment has a lot of great benefits and wonderful things and I'm proud of you as a union member because as a former union member so I think it's really wonderful and continue on with what you're doing and who knows, you may, you may uh, be running the department before everything's said and done. So congratulations. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Williams. Thank you very much for everything you've considered and doing. Thank you for being a member of 1464 along with the leadership of Mr. Simon. Uh, in life, those that take small steps are the ones that make it all the way up to another level. And in your case, this is your first or second or third step but I can see in you that your determination, your ability to keep going forward and helping people is what it takes. And remember, Local 1464 is what keeps the Tampa, city of Tampa moving and clean and wonderful. So thank you very much for all the work that all you do, no matter where you work at in the city, well, 4,000 employees are looking at you and said, now if he can do it, so can I. So right. you're leading, you're giving an inspiration to people who might just think of coming to work, you know, eight to five or whatever, 
but you had separated your experience and doing your work to best of your ability, and congratulations on getting the award. Thank you. Congratulations to you, sir. Yes. You've worked hard. You are part of the family that is the city of Tampa. Thank you for everything you do. Congratulations yes, to you. Yes, I appreciate it. Now, this is what you know. And I don't know if you know if he's trailblazing here in Tampa and at East Tampa, but he felt compelled to want to come up and bless you. This is Coach, what I call Pastor Willis, Willis Dixon. Okay. He's a long time hero of East Tampa and his community. He's also been there for young folks to make sure that we have opportunities in our community. So Mr. Dixon wants to bless you. All right. How you doing? Good, uh, good morning, the council person. Uh, I am the Reverend Willis G. Dixon, the founder and CEO of the Coach Foundation and a former school teacher. And at the age of 90 years old, I want to invest in our youth. So I know they say uh, check and verify. I may not be any good. So, <laughs> so uh, what I want to give you is a ceremony okay. on this Saturday at 1002 East Dr. Martin Luther King. I'll give you another uh, gift card that's good to go to the hard rest of money. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yes, you know. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's my great pleasure here today to give the Officer of the Month uh, commendation to Angelica Torres. Uh, if she would, how are you, ma'am? It's a real pleasure to meet you. Nice yes, ma'am. How are you doing? Um, I, I uh, did some research on this wonderful, wonderful individual um, who uh, formerly was in the United States Marine Corps and now does wonderful work here in the city of Tampa on mental health in the community and for our officers. And um, I would like to invite uh, Chief uh, Bennett, if you'd like to come up, ma'am, come on up. It's okay, Bennett O'Connor, it's, it's okay. It's say, I'm, I'm getting over, I'm, I have had a cold for four days. I'm slow today. I apologize. My mind is not working. Good morning, City Council. Chief Mary O'Connor here with the Tampa Police Department. <laughs> here to present Officer of the Month for June 2022. As Councilman Vieira said, Officer Angelica Torres, we are very proud to present her here today. She started her career with Tampa PD in 2019. Before coming to our department, she was a member of the San Diego's Police Department Behavioral Health Unit. In February 2021, Officer Torres had agreed to take a school resource officer assignment so she could assist with the development of our behavioral health unit for our department. While she was assigned to a school, she would regularly meet with our behavioral health unit leadership at the assigned school and assist with the development of the unit. Her expertise in behavioral health was evident. She took a very proactive role in helping formulate ideas and make recommendations that would be used in the program's operational success. She assisted in writing several policies, the standard operating procedure for the unit, and in July of 2021, she was permanently assigned, rightfully so, to our behavioral health unit. During her time with this unit, she has continued to develop her knowledge of the mental health field related to law enforcement. She has immersed herself in studying statutes surrounding Baker Acts. The care and concern that she demonstrates on a daily basis for the individuals she has in her caseload are evident during the weekly staffing meetings. She vigorously advocates for her clients, ensuring that they receive the services they so need and deserve. Recently, Officer Torres was hand selected to attend the International Association of Chiefs of Police Symposium on Officer Safety and Wellness. 
There she developed a deeper desire to bring back what she learned from the symposium to help create an internal officer wellness program at Tampa PD. She's currently working towards establishing an on-call procedure for the chaplain program to provide better access for officers when the need arises to speak to a police chaplain. Finally, our agency began training our own 40-hour CIT, which is Critical Intervention Training Course, for our holdover classes, which is our newest recruits. Being a CIT-trained officer, she was called upon to assist in the training of our new officers. She provided insight into mental health and was one of the primary role players. As a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, Officer Torres was able to provide insight into veterans that also suffer from PTSD and other mental health issues. While Officer Torres is young to our department, she carries herself and demonstrates the knowledge of a very tenured officer. She has in, been an invaluable asset to our behavioral health unit. For these reasons, Officer Angelica Torres has been selected as Tampa Police Department's Officer of the Month for June 2022. And Council, I'd just like to say, I know that um, you guys have heard me say before that wellness is very important, behavioral health is very important to our community and our department, and Officer Torres is leading the way in making sure that this very important initiative gets moved forward. So I'm, I'm especially grateful for her hard work. Thank you, Thank Chief. You. Thank you. That's what I get for taking NyQuil last night. Um, <laughs> it, it affects me significantly. Well, in, before we begin with the, um, the gifts and whatnot, I would like to present this Officer of the Month commendation to Tampa Police Officer Angelica Torres, who does such a great job. We appreciate all of the hard work that you do. And uh, we appreciate, and you've been in Tampa for how long again? Since 2019. Wow, so three years and you're taking over. That's great. Well, God bless you. Dios te bendiga. We appreciate you so much. Here you go, ma'am. Thank you. We appreciate you. And if you'd like to say a few words. Absolutely. Good morning to all. Uh, thank you to Chief and staff. Thank you to City Council for this award. I'm definitely humbled by this experience. I'm grateful. I am proud to be a police officer with the Tampa Police Department. And as Chief said, mental health is important to me and I will continue to give the community members my very, very best. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. And before we hear from council members, we have some gifts of appreciation from the community. Uh, PBA, go ahead, guys. Good morning, City Council. Darla Portman, Tampa PBA President. Brandon Barkley, Vice President of the Tampa PBA. I just want to tell you I'm super proud of you. You embody what a police officer is. You show city council in the community. You care for the community, but you also care for the police officers by showing how you take mental health as a, as a serious issue that's going on in our community, but also in our department. So I appreciate everything you do, and I also am very proud that you're a member of the Tampa PBA. <laughs> so we got um, Bush Gardens tickets for four. Uh, Pete Revy couldn't be here today to give them to you, so we have those. And we also have a plaque that was also made by one of our officers that works here. Thank you. Keep Thank you. doing a great job. Good job. Donna McBride, Strath Center. Officer Torres, it's my pleasure to meet you. And thank you so much for all you're doing for our officers and the community. And it's especially um, humbling to know that in this day and time, wellness means a great many things. And your understanding of that is very important to our city. Okay. The Strath Center would like for you to enjoy the show Thank on our behalf, and we hope we see you often. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, Council. My name is Jeff Houck. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for the Columbia Restaurant Group. On behalf of the Gonsmart family and the 1,200 employees of our company, I want to thank you for your dedication to this vital topic. And we'd like to invite you to use this gift card at our Columbia <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. Um, hope you enjoy it. Um, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good morning, Council. Good morning, Chief. Good morning, Officer Torres. Good morning, sir. Uh, Brian Ford with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and we have a little tradition over at One Buck. Anybody that goes over and above gets a game ball. And uh, hearing your story, thank you for your military service, your thank sacrifice, you. your service for our city, and looking out for our younger officers and our community. Thank you so much, We appreciate sir. all you do. Thank you so much. Again, well, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Council. Mike MacArthur, Steps Towing Service, and 
Officer, congratulations on a job well done. Thank you so much. And it sounds like you need to take some time off, enjoy it, <laughs> you know, have a little bit of you time. So on behalf of Todd Steph and Steph's Towing, we'd like to present you with a $50 gift card to a restaurant of your choice here, and also a night out in our company limousine. Take you, we get a group of friends, up, up, up to 18 people, go out, have some fun, take some time off, have some, you know, a, a good time on us. So thank, thank you, you so for everything much. you do, and uh, congratulations. Good morning, council members. Lynn Earhart, Tampa Theater. Officer Torres, congratulations. On behalf of the Tampa Theater, we want to uh, give you this little bit of gratitude and a gift membership to the Tampa Theater and to thank you um, for protecting our community and our businesses here in Tampa. Again, thank congratulations. Thank you so much, ma'am. Be safe out there. Thank you. Uh -oh. Good what do you say O oh, for? Me <laughs> expecting something? <laughs> let me uh, let me start by saying that you are joining the long blue line that started uh, with these uh, various commercial enterprises 30 years ago when we started giving officer of the month and firefighter of the quarter uh, gift certificates and it grew out of various um, different restaurants and, and commercial enterprises that wanted to recognize officers who who did outstanding service and went above and beyond uh, nominated by their peers, confirmed by the chief and their supervisors, and uh, I, I can't say anything more. But you, you, you're not at the end of the line. Hopefully, we'll we'll continue doing this as for as long as they'll allow us. And um, we want to recognize you from the Chicho's Restaurant Group. Again, you're going to have a lot of places to go and eat. Uh, enjoy yourself over there. <clears throat> enjoy yourself at the meat market. Um, again, fifty dollars worth of gift certificates. And, uh, and you're, I know you're talking about health, and so I'm sure you believe in the Y. Uh, so you have a gift certificate to go to the Y, and the Yummy House China Bistro, and uh, Bella Brava, which is over in the Midtown, a new, new development over there. So here are your gift certificates. If you have any trouble with this, my phone number's on here, and I guarantee them, okay? So they're not phony. <laughs> they, they, they will work. It's not cash. But it's just as good as cash, so I appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, and hoorah for the Marines. Hoorah. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And we have our friends at the Lightning could not be here today, so they asked me to present this uh, $50 gift certificate from the Lightning. Here you go, madam. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Council, if you'd like to say anything. Councilman Carlson. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you for uh, upgrading communities by moving here. <laughs> um, and thank you for your service in the Marines. Um, you know, two years ago, we heard loud and clear from the community that mental health was an important um, issue that we need to address. And uh, City Council has pushed hard for the last couple of years to make sure we um, have programs and funding for mental health. Thank you to the uh, police chief and others for, uh, for pushing that forward. Um, what you're doing is, is helping to solve some of the most important uh, challenges in the community and hopefully helping to prevent crimes that uh, that other folks in your department will have to deal with. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Mesco. Thank you very much. Just to echo what Councilman Carlson said, you know, me mental health is so important and that we invest in that because although they say health is wealth and they think it's, you know, what you eat and exercising, everything starts, a lot starts here. And what starts here uh, when it's not properly taken care of or addressed can trigger so many other things, you know, for anybody in general. You're with the police department, you know, the stress of the job and everything else, mental health is, is everything. So we appreciate having you here. Thank you for coming here. It was a long, long move, but we appreciate all that you do for everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Councilwoman Hurtag. Um, I want to echo um, the other council members' uh, sentiments on the importance of mental health. Uh, but I also want to uh, just highlight the um, how you are helping to reduce the, the mental health stigma within the department as well. I think it's very important for the entire community, but I know uh, that within the department as well, you just, everybody, you know, do the best they can and get help when they need it. And I think that's the wonderful thing with the community and the department how now mental health is, is getting more attention, and it's very important, and I just want to say thank you for your work, and I look forward to seeing more of what you do. Thank you so much, ma'am. 
Well, congratulations this morning. Uh, mental health illness is very, it's a very chronic thing now in our communities, all communities. And uh, I don't know if it's the food, we're, 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 what they're putting in the food or what's going on, but it seems like uh, the, the newer generations are experiencing probably a different uh, mentality than when I grew up. But I'm glad that we have somebody who's taking courses, classes to train other officers. You know, I used to hate to hear that word, signal 20. I think they changed that now, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know what it's called now, but you know, you hear that, you're like, uh-oh. But I'm glad that we've got somebody who's working hard to make a difference and make a difference in the officers' minds as well. And that brings on a lot when you're dealing with people in our community because you just don't know to know what they're going through. So I'm glad you're part of the force and making that uh, transition with the department to do better. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Like I uh, said before, myself, the other speakers, uh, mental health when I was growing up wasn't in the top anywhere. It wasn't known about. And I attribute that, that we didn't have anything, but we thought we had everything. Now most of them have everything, and they don't know what they have. And uh, when you get to that point in life and you have the pressures that we in America have to succeed, to go forward, to be the best you can be, and so forth and so on, and you hear about everything that's going on in life, and today, every time you turn on the TV, somebody's getting shot. And uh, it, it's both on both sides of the aisle, anywhere in America. And, and that, along with other pressures of life, that you have to be under pressure to succeed. You have to do better. You have to do this. You have to do that. It's recognized one of the leading illnesses in America now is mental health. And I want to thank you for what you've done yesterday, what you're doing today, what you're going to do tomorrow, and what you and this department will do forever to protect everyone in excesses, protect yourself by curing some of the ills that you have with mental health. Muchísimas gracias por todo Gracias. Gracias. Every officer's job is tough. And any time they answer a call, they never know what they're going to expect. For you especially. You are skilled, you've proven yourself, and I thank you for everything you do for this community. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. And I'll take this for you. I'm gonna hit me now. <laughs> At this time, we will be taking public comment. If you're wishing to speak, oh yes, I'm sorry. We do have Red Cross. Red Cross. Thank you, Councilwoman Hurtak. Who is going to be doing that? Is that? Also. We have representatives from the Red Cross here. Yes, sir. Please come forward. This is your time. Good morning, and thank you for having us. That is rather hard to follow because I must say, the Red Cross also provides mental health services to people who have had a disaster. So that really spoke to our hearts. My name is Ella Landagger. Tomorrow, I hope, I will become the chair of the Tampa Bay chapter of the Red Cross. This is Eric Corliss, who is our executive director for Tampa Bay, as well as being the regional CEO across all of Central Florida, from here all the way over to the Space Coast. And I'm looking at the room and I'm just thinking, oh, isn't this nice? So many people dressed in red. Yay. <laughs> All right. Go for it. So, Chair, Council Members, and, and the City, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the mission of the Red Cross. And uh, what we want to go through briefly is how we serve the City, but also around the world. We are a global movement, and we're going to walk through that. But here's our mission, and I don't know if, we, if, if you all can see it, but it's to read it for those that can, is to alleviate human suffering through the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers that is enabled by the generosity of our donors. So here are our lines of service, and we're gonna focus in on something that's been significant 
in the last couple of years, and that is the frequency and intensity of disasters that have affected the United States and its territories. We've been fortunate in Florida, particularly Tampa in the last two years, that we haven't seen what are in the others. But I'm going to touch base on this first. Our service armed forces, we maintain a critical communi communication link to people within uh, the Tampa area and their loved ones. We also brief new recruits that go through the MEPS uh, station, the Military Entrance Processing Center in Tampa, which is one of the busiest in the country, and briefing the new family members, many of them are new to the service community, about the, the stresses and the challenges and on the theme of mental health. How do you support and, and care for your loved one who's been in combat, who's been in conflict zones? that we have seen in the last couple of years and the impact that it's having not only on the service member but their loved ones when they come home and their caregivers. Uh, we'll talk about disaster services. We do collect 40% of the nation's blood supply. Uh, we're the largest blood bank in the United States and its territories. And then we do CPR and first aid training and international services, which right now I'd be remiss if I didn't reference. The Red Cross is a global movement and uh, we have Red Crossers that are around Ukraine that are providing humanitarian assistance to those who have fled the area. The Red Cross has a unique role through the ICRC, the International Committee of Red Cross, to look for and help negotiate um, safe passage of non-combatants out of conflict zones. And that's a role that the Red Cross has around the globe because of the Geneva Conventions, and it's a key part of what we do in the fulfillment of the United States compliance with the Geneva Conventions. Here's a snapshot of the region. But here's what I wanted to come to and talk about and the point of why we're here. And I don't know about y'all, but when I saw Hurricane Agatha in the Pacific come across Central America and then come in the Gulf and become Tropical Storm Alex, it reinforces what we've seen over the last two years. So when you look at this map, this is a graphic provided by NOAA. And in 2020, not only did we have COVID, but what we had of significance was $22 billion disasters. And then the previous decade, the average was $12 billion disasters. And then you move to 2021, and we are at $20 billion disasters, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. And so what we're seeing is this increase in the significance of the, the scope scale, and there is no longer a non-disaster season. We're seeing hurricanes, tornadoes, a derecho. We have the floods, tornadoes, and wildfires on the West Coast. And now more than ever, it's important that we are preparing and everybody who can that we prepare and we reach out to vulnerable communities and help them prepare. Because what we had prior to these years where we had a couple of weeks in shelters, we're seeing families staying in Red Cross shelters, congregate care shelters for up to 90 days. And the reason they're not able to leave is what we three things. We put it in three buckets, health, hunger, and housing. And it's that ability to access affordable housing. And when you have a disaster come in and the, the effects that it has on the community is significant. So the need for us to work together and get the preparedness message out there is more critical than ever. And that's part of what we wanna to talk to, to move people forward, to talk about what can you do now, because it is hurricane season, and to get ready. And to that, I'll turn it back over to Ella, who will be the chair of our board of directors for the American Red Cross of Tampa Bay and her particular passion is preparedness, so Ella. Thank you. Preparedness, I'm sure everyone here is well aware that we are in hurricane season. That is something obviously we hope everyone is taking seriously, especially anyone who's listening in on this streaming, please make sure that you are ready. I just wanna remind you to get a kit, make a plan and be informed. One, that, that's a really important thing, to have that kit, to have that go bag. Um, as it happens, last week my mother's apartment building had a fire. And she lives in a senior residence and 150 seniors streamed out of the building. Nobody was hurt. And the first thing they were thinking about was, where are my medications? Where's my phone? Where's my charger? I suggest that you have a list, you put it together, put it in a trunk in your suitcase, throw it in your closet, and have that list ready so that eventually, if you have to leave for a hurricane, you know where your things are, you know what you're looking for. In a fire, you don't grab anything, just get out and stay out. But start being prepared now, thinking ahead where your things are if you had to leave or you asked a firefighter to go retrieve it for you. That said, one of the wonderful things that we have available to you for free is Ready Rating. The Red Cross offers Ready Rating, and it's readyrating.org, to all organizations, whether they be community-based, faith-based, 
regular corporations, mom and pop shops, as we learned during COVID, a whole lot of them did not do very well when they could not be in their physical locations. Ready Rating helps you walk through the steps. It's a very quick five minute program or there's a longer one online that goes through 20, so it's either, so you either do the quick five minute one and then hopefully you get sucked in and do the long one. But we suggest you talk to all of your constituents, everybody in Tampa, north, south, wherever they are, to look at readyrating.org. Even every homeowners association could help with that. Right here, okay. This is the fun part that I get to do. I get to go into schools and we talk to children basically kindergarten through grade five. We have two different programs. Obviously, they're slightly different emotional levels. Last year, we had the incredible privilege of being able to stream our program and it was available to every single school here in Tampa, as well as all of Hillsborough County, talking about preparedness. I hope one day this becomes part of their curriculum. I think this is a really important piece because every child in Florida will face hurricanes. If there are schools in your district, summer programs, boys and girls clubs, YMCA programs, let them know about it. We go in and we will talk to them in person whenever possible. And it is really fun. <laughs> hurricanes, we normally talk about 120 hour timeline. Right now we're actually going and stretching out past 160 hours. And that's because we need to move things up and down the state and so on. However, what I just learned is when we were hearing from the head of the National Hurricane Center, he said of the 10 last category five storms, nine of them were only a tropical depression three days out of hitting land. They sped up, they picked up more water, and then they slammed into land. So although we try to work on the long time frame, as Eric said, storms are getting bigger, faster, and have a far bigger impact than they did. So please do talk to your constituents, talk to everybody to please get a kit, make a plan and be informed. And that's why. Here's a quick picture just of what happens during the storm. Although in actuality, if you go to an evacuation center, there are no cots, there are no blankets. You get the floor. This is what you would have, the floor that's in front of you, that's it. Bring your own pillow, bring your own blanket. The cots come in afterwards when we're helping people relocate but that's after the storm. During the storm, it's there as shelter. And we do provide water and snacks in that time frame. After the storm, obviously we want people to be very careful, not walk into flooded waters. And this is what we are always happy to come in and talk to people about that. And yes, we're always looking for volunteers as well. So we have the before, the during, and the after. The more we can prepare, the better we can face a storm. And obviously then the recovery gets better and better. Our people go out into the community and assess it. I suggest everyone right now stop and even if you're in this room, pull out your phone and tell yourself you will download the Red Cross emergency app and the first aid app. They're free, they're available on any of the phone stores. But emergency, it has a red exclamation mark. So just type in Red Cross emergency and I'll get it to you. And you can then put in and you will get the warnings, not just here, but you can put in your family that's anywhere else in the United States and it will let you know what's going on in their areas. My children are scattered around. I can tell when something's happening there and someone's be like, be careful walking home, there's a tornado in your area. You know, it's that kind of a thing. It's a really great idea to do that. Also, anytime, redcross.org slash prepare Florida puts you into our office and it's one way you can find me. Communication, again, we're on everywhere and all around. I hope to meet any one of you at any time. Please give Eric and I a call. We'd be happy to come in and meet with you more of a one-on-one. -on -one. But this, I hope everyone out there knows we're there for you. We are sort of the scene behind the scene. The first responders are out there dealing with buildings in crisis, whether it's you know, fires or hurricanes, and then we're there to help with the people that have been affected. We always need volunteers in a variety of roles. A lot of them are even virtual. You can be at home on a computer and helping us feed people on the other side of the state even. Um, so there's varying levels and here you can see on it where we've got the disaster action team, the person would go out in a vest like this, which I hope you never see. I saw my first one at 5 a.m. in the morning in New York when I walked out of my burning building and there was someone who materialized and said, hi, I'm with the Red Cross. We're here to provide shelter, clothing. Do you need anything? How can we help you? That was 35 years ago. You never forget that moment. 
So please, I hope you never have to see someone in this in your hour of need, but please remember we are always there and we always could use more people to help us being there. I mentioned the apps that we have available, the Ready Rating, so please mark readyrating.org. We also have, and you can find it through the Prepare Florida website, on second and fourth Thursdays, we do a webinar on hurricane and home fire preparedness. Anyone, everyone is always welcome to join us on that. And on behalf of myself and Dr. Ken, who is unavailable today, and Eric, I say thank you very much for listening to this message. One day we'll come back and we'd like to get accommodation, but hopefully not because we had a hurricane, uh, but just because we're always there for everyone in your community. And so thank you very much for your time, everyone back here. The other message I'm gonna just leave you with, have you done a fire drill at school? Everyone, hands up, remember doing those? Have you ever done one at home? How about it? Where do you spend more time? Home, school, work. It's always at home. Please, do a fire drill at home. Think about two exits from every room. Get out in less than two minutes. Fire spread faster than you can possibly imagine. And check those alarms every single month and do that fire drill twice a year. So it's two minutes out, twice a year do that fire drill. Every month check those smoke alarms. And most importantly, have a safe meeting spot away from your home. Because if you have a meeting spot, you all go to the same place and you're not running around looking for each other. The most tragic <coughs> is when we hear of an adult going back into a building or a child going back into a building looking for a parent. Please have a meeting spot so you're all there and let the firefighters do their job in terms of going into buildings. Never ever go into a burning building. That is, I'm sure you've heard of it, the worst tragedies we encounter. So, thank you. Council thank members. You for your time. Councilor Miranda. Hey, thank you. Thank your organization, the Red Cross. We live today in a world that's ever changing, not because we want to change it, but we've been abusing it for so long that the environment is so thin that the areas like Colorado, like New Mexico, something that what, fires are there that have been going on there now for a long period of time. And you look at California, you look at the, what's happening there, and you look throughout the country, right now in the middle part of the country, they're much hotter than we are, and we're down south, and they're up north, and they're having heat strokes 110, 105 degrees. These are not normal things. These are things that we, the human beings, have created. No one to blame but us. Not only in this country, but in China, another industrious country, all over Europe and South America. You cannot continue doing what we're doing. You must take a look back, a step back, and understand what if we had all those things back. Would it be the same? Would you have the same type of hurricane? Would you have the same forest fires? And the answer more likely is no. So we want to thank you for saying yes to helping everyone who said, continue doing what you're doing. It's fine. It's never going to end. It may end in the wrong way. But thank you and your organization for what you do. And God bless each and every one of you. Councilman Carlson. Same thing. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything you all do. You all have been involved in the world's greatest disasters and have come through for all kinds of people and have come through in Florida during terrible disasters. I pray every day and hope everyone else will pray that we never get a uh, direct hit that, that hits us like Katrina or Andrew or one of those other mm -hmm. hurricanes and that we can instead be donors to other communities that, to help them. Uh, thank you for sharing your personal story. It's a good reminder that we all need to do that. and. And please, if you all have information like I, I, um, like the the app and other things, please be sure to send it to us so that we can post it on our social media channels mm -hmm. to make sure our constituents know too. Thank you. Councilman Goods. Thank you for what your organization does. Uh, I've been in a fire, up taking people out of a fire. Uh, the heat is so intense with a fire. We. And you always tell people you're right, do not re-enter because you will not get out. Because you cannot see. You can't see at all. You have to stay low to the ground if you do. And look for a little light, but usually it's pitch dark and you can't see, so you can't find your way out. That's why it's so very important that you have a loved one and you want to go back and save them. But the heat is so intense, as soon as you hit the door frame, you're going to start to burn on your skin very badly. And you're going to be engulfed with the with the with the smoke, the black thick smoke or gray, and it just overtakes your body right away. 
I do like the fact that you gave a few tips. And the Red Cross does a lot of disasters, but the most disasters they go to pretty much on a day and out basis are fires. Yes, sir. There are four a day in our region. Right. They're, they're house fires. Mm -hmm. You talk about shelter. Yes. You talk about displacement. But the best thing that you could have told people is the meeting spot. Because if someone comes out or someone makes it out, they know where that spot is. And they can tell fire tell us, hey, Johnny didn't come out yet because he's not, or he or she is not at the meeting spot. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. Fire detectors. Batteries go out. You, you think they're Duracell and they last forever, but they don't. <laughs> Not they only don't. that, but if they're yellow, please replace them because the beep might work, but the smoke detecting part Correct. does not. So I, I, I like those tips. Hopefully people will, in the audience will take that back to our communities as well. The streaming, but those are two critical points that people need to understand. So thank you for the information this morning. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, thank you for this. Uh, I. Most, most times I have uh, seen Red Cross work has been international, so it's nice to look at the, the domestic side and think about, of course, what you do here, uh, which is a wholly different role. So uh, I want to say thank you uh, for coming at the beginning of hurricane season to remind everyone. I did not know about the app, so I'm very excited, and I'm going to echo Councilman Carlson's request to please just send it to us so we can push it out on our social media and encourage, uh, we can send it out to neighborhoods, things like that when we go talk to people about preparedness. Um, the city does a great job uh, with us, but we also, we, we need to share that with, uh, with our constituents and with the community <coughs> everywhere. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very Thank much you. for your time. We appreciate it. And we hope whoever's out there, you're listening and paying attention. Thank yeah. you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for the support of Brian. Okay, now at this time we will have public comment. If anyone wishing to give public comment at this time, please approach the podium. We wouldn't mind forming a line. Mr. Adams, you can stay there. Forming a line, my left, your right. Please and thank you. Mr. Adams. Good morning, Council. Uh, I have been in. State your name, please. Um, Eddie Adams, Jr. I, I have been informed that this, the United States government, Hillsborough County, have recognized and have official Juneteenth Day celebrations and it's a, it's a holiday. It's a national holiday, it's a county holiday, but it's not a city of Tampa holiday. And the request was made last year for the city to consider it. And I'm, I'm quite sure you see that they have about 20 or 30 Juneteenth events going on within the next couple of weeks. And, and, and I think it's a disservice, because I know all you good guys up there are Democrats, and it's a celebration of freedom for black folks, and that's your highest, biggest constituent for voting and, and helping you guys do stuff. And for the city not to recognize Juneteenth as a holiday, uh, you're doing a significant disservice and disrespect to a, a community that, that highly favors you guys. I mean, the, the one that's here, about 15 years ago, I was involved uh, with the, the Sheriff Black Advisory Council, and the sh Sheriff David G. decided that he wanted to do his thing on the same day that we used to celebrate and award uh, <laughs> black members of his staff and jail and bailiffs and all that stuff, you know, so, so they decided they want to put them all together. So they took that day from us. And so we decided we're going to take a day, find a day that white folks can't, can't take from us. So that's when we started a Juneteenth breakfast. That's about 15 years ago. And then we moved on to a Juneteenth luncheon. And we've been having the luncheon every year for the last 10 years, except for the COVID. And, and, and now, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the, the national leader of the Juneteenth Coalition was going to be our guest speaker, 
at our Tampa Juneteenth luncheon. So that was going to be a big deal, but, but he got sick. So I am here to request from you guys, and the young ladies left, but, you know, that, that you do what you need to do to make Juneteenth a holiday for the city of Tampa. But, because you're missing the opportunity to do something for a significant part of your community. And this event is going to get bigger. I mean, when I first started, you know, like 15 years ago, St. Pete had already been doing it for 10 years. You know, so we are behind, behind the time on, on all this stuff. But I want it to be so that the month of June, we're doing stuff all month long. And uh, Reverend Dixon? And Reverend Dixon, we, we, okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goose. Mr. Mr. Adams, a year ago I made that request to the administration of motion. I, was, I, would, uh, I thought maybe about six or seven months I did another request asking for an update. Uh, I was told this time that they're in negotiations because we have a union over here, so they're in negotiations. I'm hoping that regardless of negotiations or not, that that is implemented because the city can't implement it regarding negotiation or not. They can implement that, so I'm hoping that's going to be done uh, with this next contract, hopefully, uh, you know, sooner rather than later when it comes out. Uh, I know I'll be looking for that uh, and making sure that we, we have that implemented. So I'm, and again, a lot of my colleagues here, I, I know that they've been talking about it as well, so I'm hoping that that's going to be implemented in the upcoming year. So thank you, sir. Hopefully, hopefully not another Juneteenth celebration come in the city of Tampa and the city council is not on board. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, council. I, I had a couple of pictures I wanted to display. Your name, please. What's that? Your name. Oh, my name is Andy Savitt. I'm here to discuss uh, or mention a, a huge flooding issue located off of Tampa Street between uh, just south of Columbus, uh, between Amelia and Francis. And it's the alleyway that goes between those two. So I have a few pictures. I could send them later if it's a hassle to connect up. If not, if, I'm if you to would, if you'd like to put them in the Elmo and you could show us while you're talking, I could do. I have a computer or phone. Is either one? E either one will work. Okay. You got your so, three minutes. I gotcha. I could do it while I'm talking. Basically, this has been ongoing for many years. The uh, stormwater, uh, which the stormwater folks uh, kind of blame it on, on the high, the Florida Department of Transportation and back and forth, and it's a lot of runaround. Basically, when it rains, it. Do I just show the screen? Is that the best way to go yes. about it? Okay. So the problem is, is every time there's rain, basically from Tampa Road comes down from one block west comes down and there's accumulation of about six houses in the alley, huge water problem. The city did come and take a look and basically they said, well, what we could do for you is we can uh, resurface crushed gravel on the, um, on the alleyway. That is not the solution. Basically what it's doing is dissipating water into everybody's yard in that area. So it tends to happen, and let me just uh, see if I can do this while we're talking. What tends to happen, so this is just off of my property. Can you lift the top of your screen up just maybe about a half inch to stop that glare? Up? Your screen. Angle it. There ah, you go. Okay. Thank you. So basically, as you could see with a minute and eight seconds left, the water is just huge. It's coming from the alley, uh, and it just accumulates not only on, on this property, but also <laughs> it's being stubborn. But anyways, come on. So what happens is, again, there's about six houses that floods. It, it is a, a major uh, issue that's been addressed. It's being neglected. This is literally a pond. Cars will come through the alley and either have to wait till the rain stops and the water settles, or they'll go and sit in a car and wait until they could get. So the line it comes up almost to about a foot and a half on, on all these properties. And what happens is 
in this case, intensified by the location of builder uh, Daniel Gomez built the property uh, 106 uh, West Amelia. He built up the property as according to plan and basically it just, yep, and it basically just uh, intensified the problem. There's also, I believe, another gentleman that will be following soon. Thank you very much. Before you, before you leave the podium, before you leave the podium, the address of that property is 104 West Amelia. Amelia? Amelia, A-M-E-L-I-A -E Street. <coughs> and, uh, and I actually have a picture real quick, and this may be uh, a little bit shy, but this is actually, so it's not only coming from the alley, this is the front of the property, that it's actually coming over a curb. The curbs were intentionally built about a foot high, and I'm trying to escape, <laughs> but, uh, and, and it still is coming from the front over the curb into the, the, the property, also in the alley. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your time, council members. Mr. Breeze. D'Angelo, I'm sorry. Buongiorno, my name is Angel. Um, I took another day off work to be here with you all. Um, great joy of my life. Um, so the last time we were here, we talked extensively about some items that we're hoping that you're going to leave here today with the first reading of the ordinance to implement, because your staff is going to be doing their staff report. Good news for them. We already did a lot of that research for them. Um, we sent it to you several times. It got sent through the gr group at Florida Rising, through the People's Council. So you have so much research. I mean, so much going in your favor. In 2021, the city of Tampa won the Super Bowl or whatever, and we were Champa Bay. Well, right now, the city of Miami has uh, passed what we're asking for, so they already beat us there. The city of Orlando is actually really extensively looking in rent control, so they're about to beat us. At this rate, Liberty County, Florida is gonna have rent control before Tampa. Does that sound like Champa Bay to you? Because it sounds like we're losing. So my hope today is that we leave with not only an ordinance to implement, the Miami-Dade ordinance, as well as a housing emergency and rent control, but we do that with a unanimous vote, because there shouldn't be a reason why that doesn't happen. Now, if you're not aware, your voting block is here in the room wearing red, and there's a lot of people watching at home because they can't take the time away from work. People in, uh, who aren't in the nine to five scene don't have the privilege to come here and, and speak to you about these issues or sit on the CMT and wait. Y'all took the voicemail option away. So they can't sit by the screen and wait because they have jobs that face the public. So they're not able to do that. Um, we also have people with disabilities. We have people who are low income, people who are transit insecure who can't be here. And we're gonna be reaching out to them in March during the election season. And things, aren't, things are just not really looking good for this city council. We've been told how progressive the city council is. We got 60 days notice for rent. We've overfunded the police department. We never have money for anything else but policing. I was surprised the officer of the month this year didn't have like a, a disciplinary record this long because the one a couple, what, two months ago or whatever was like fired and rehired for violations. Like, I would love to be able to have that kind of record and be employee of the month. I get like threes out of five on my performance review and I'm like excited because it's just like, hey, I did that and I have not ever taken a life or wrongfully taking someone's liberty, and all I get is threes? I would like to be, I'm gonna to talk to my boss to see if I can start being rated on those metrics, because that would be phenomenal. Um, but at the end of the day, the metrics we grade you on are what are you doing for us, the people, and us, the people, are hurting. The housing crisis is not gonna be solved by rent control, because there's people who are already houseless. We also need to invest in housing first. Housing first works everywhere, Minneapolis, Seattle. If you need that research, I got it for you, too. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Keila McCaskey. I don't have on red, but I stand with the People's Council and uh, Florida Robin Lockett over at Florida Rising. Um, I want to thank uh, Councilman Vieira and Councilman Goods for this past weekend for acting so quickly 
um, in a matter where some residents were living in unsafe, hazardous housing. And, and thank you for uh, actually standing up and actually getting her temporary housing rather quickly. And that sends a message when you all do that. It sends a message that uh, slumlord activity is not acceptable in the greater Tampa Bay area. Oh, I'm not here for that, though. I just want to thank you. A while back, you all voted to have a, a possibilities uh, to research a probate program. And what that would do is hopefully provide assistance to those individuals in this uh, situation, in marginalized communities, or low income or middle income, that can't afford to actually navigate through the probate process. I came by to share some information because on, uh, two days ago I hosted a, um, a probate summit. And what we found from the Hillsborough County property appraiser is approximately there's about $1.1 billion in real estate potentially sitting or awaiting to go through uh, the probate process, which is an indication that too many people are living in homes with no legal right, pretty much. They can't do anything in that home except for occupy it for as long as the household would stand. They can't apply for FEMA assistance in the event of a hurricane. They can't go pay the delinquent taxes, I don't believe, if it goes too far. They can't contact the bank to make any negotiations. They can't even participate in the city program for rehabilitation because essentially they don't own the home. The people are living in a situation almost like a squatter because all they can do is occupy it and it's almost unauthorized until it goes through the probate process. And as a individual in the community um, that has a very small nonprofit organization, I'm not an elected official, but I feel compelled to do something to help people get through the process when they're living in a home as almost a squatter. When I saw that information, I felt compelled to do even more than we're already trying to do. So what I'm asking for, I'm not sure if they're gonna come back today or not, because it was on the, I believe it was scheduled for today. But I want to ask again that you all consider as elected officials, your, the constituents should be your primary concern. I'm going to ask that you would approve a program that will assist with identifying a program that could help. Because doing this program will help improve uh, conditions of neighborhoods by eliminating blight and the quality of life in the neighborhoods. Secondly, uh, a home in many families is the largest asset. It will help them continue in, in their generational wealth. Doing this program will make you feel good as an elected official because you actually can say that you help people maintain their family home. You end the racial estate planning gap. 65% of white Americans have estate planning and 23% of black or Hispanic does. That's a great gap. And this, I want to ask the staff in closing if they would just factor in the amount if we would only save 20% of the individuals in this city that are in that category, in the probate that needs to go through the process, how much they would earn on just inheritance tax and how much they would earn in property taxes. I believe it's over a couple, a couple mil, hundred million dollars. Do the math and you'll see the benefit of this program. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Casco. Yes, sir. Councilman Goose. I, I, just, I just saw Ms. Philly come in. I attended the summit couple days ago with uh, property president Enriquez and you can I mean you can tell his passion and wanting to do something uh, he sees it I mean the amount of money that could be revenue to all city in this county is astronomical but Ms. Fee is going to talk about it a little bit later when we get to that item uh, I did have a conversation with her yesterday of uh, uh, remaking the motion that uh, I'm going to restate later on in reference to how we can get with the other entities to look at some type of policy or program uh, within the county. Uh, so we'll be restating a motion with that. And I did talk to her yesterday. That's why you didn't see it. I'm memorandum uh, in your files this morning, gentlemen. Thank you. Hi, good morning, Councilman. Uh, my name is Kathy Kastner. I am from the neighborhood of Forest Hills, and I'm here to um, encourage you to vote today um, to approve the bid uh, for the Forest Hills Park Improvement <coughs> Project. Um, I've been very passionate about this. <laughs> Since about 2015 or 16, we got a notice that they were gonna come in and improve the park. In March of 2017, they gathered the community and we you know, decided on what amenities we would like. That was March 2017, which has been five, years ago or so. Uh, there's been a lot of delay for various reasons and we are just really excited to get this park project moving. Uh, it'll take another year I guess to complete but I'm just here to encourage you and to please ask you to vote to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you.
Morning, my name's Chuck Siegel. I've lived in Forest Hills my whole life, a little over 50 years. Uh, and I just would like to encourage you guys to go ahead and vote for this. We've been looking at making some improvements over there and, and we're just looking to make sure that we can keep the community rolling and moving and people get exercising. And that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to thank um, Chuck and Kathy. I always call uh, Chuck the mayor of Forest Hills, and then I call Kathy Congresswoman Kathy, uh, uh, and I've known them for a number of years, but for coming in. But for background, uh, just to uh, amplify, I guess, what they were talking about, this is a project that was passed back when Barack Obama was president, and here we are two presidents later, and it still hasn't come forward. So, um, you know, there have been many, many, many delays, and uh, hopefully we can remedy that immediately. But I just wanted to thank you all for coming out. It's been a priority of, of mine, certainly. And um, again, it's been d d delayed for so many reasons, so many reasons. But God willing, it'll be, it'll be remedied immediately. So I just wanted to thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And by the way, I, uh, I understand right. it where you folks live, there's the first Friday of every month, there's a what? Yeah. What now? Karaoke. I heard one of the council members been there and he sings so so. <laughs> That's what the rumor is. But thank you very much. We'll certainly look at it. Appreciate everything you've done. Take care. Good morning. My name is Susan Root. I live in Sulphur Springs. I'm also a member of the Neighborhood Association. And I'm here today to discuss affordable housing. We have a terrible problem. People are being displaced. I'm a volunteer for Ottawa Baptist Church and my job is to assist my neighbors in finding somewhere to go that they can afford and I'm having a terrible time finding this. What are we doing? Every time a program opens it's full in two days. People don't even have time to apply. We need some answers. Um, most of the properties in Sulphur Springs right now are rentals because everything is being bought up by out-of-state people. They're not doing repairs. The living conditions are deplorable. It's not getting any better, and I see nothing happening to help these people. We're having senior citizens on fixed incomes being displaced. We're having families with children being displaced. What are we doing? We need some help. People living on fixed income cannot afford these rent increases. It's just ridiculous. Three times and trying to get into a new place where you have to have three times the amount of rent to get into a place. That's close to $5,000. And, and people can't afford that. They just cannot afford that. Everybody's coming out on the streets and nobody wants the homeless. But guess what? We're gonna have a lot more. It's just gonna keep increasing. It's not getting better at all. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak my piece today and you all have a wonderful blessed day. Thank you. Good morning, Council. My name is Getulio Gonzalez Militieri. I'm here, like, housing is a human right. What are we doing here? You know, it's that simple. I, I've, we've been coming here for months, since February. Just, if you can pass it today, the Office of Tenant Advocacy, the Landlord Registry, some form of rent stabilization me uh, measure. You've heard the stories, you've heard the anecdotes. I'll add another, two members of my family had to leave the country because they can't live off of their retirement. So that, that's what's happening. And the Tampa that you knew, that most of you grew up in, is changing. People from outside are changing this city culturally because people are being displaced. The Tampa that you knew isn't gonna exist anymore unless you do something about it. That's all I got to say. Council? <clears throat> um. I want to wish folks here. Please a, state uh, your name. My name's Kat. 
I want to wish folks here a happy upcoming Juneteenth. And I want to also stand in support of uh, just to talk about how landlords continue to price gouge, mm -hmm. property taxes keep increasing, as well as food and gas and every other expense. Healthcare is still unaffordable, childcare is unaffordable. Gentrification and the displacement of the working class, especially black and brown residents, continues in every city and town in this country. So I support a landlord complaint registry, a tenant advocacy, advocacy office. Um, tenants and workers are the majority of the population in this country. I don't know if y'all know that, but they are the majority. I also support a 120 day notice for tenants when receiving a rent increase. And declaring housing a state of emergency. I was homeless for 11 months. Everywhere, housing, houselessness is increasing. Y'all can nod, but I know y'all, this is all on purpose. Like, we can talk about policies. Y'all can talk about immediacy. We know, we know this is on purpose. It's because of landlords who are hoarding homes and buying off politicians. I am neurodivergent myself, and it was very ironic walking in and seeing y'all shower that cough with praise over their mental health support when the police are infamous for abusing and murdering those who are neurodivergent and struggling. Thank you. Greetings to all of you, uh, council person. I am right now standing as the ambassador for Christ. I don't wear this red because I'm a Kappa or because of uh, Florida Rising, but I do agree with Florida Rising. But uh, there was one that said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And uh, there's only three people in here right now that could understand what I'm talking about, attorney, uh, Morris Massey, Councilman uh, Charlie Miranda. They were around when uh, a lot of destruction came into the black community. People were displaced. And here, our beloved mayor was, it's my disclaimer, she was not the mayor. But it started back with Mayor Bill Poe when they started taking all of the property in the black community. And I, last week I heard someone say, well, I wasn't around when all this happened. But I want you to know every person that's white is benefiting from what happened to black people. You're benefiting today. So therefore, I want you to do as Mayor Castor said, take accountability for what of, of the destruction that you have done within the city of Tampa. And I want you to know that District 5 not only have one council member, but have three more. All of the at-large councilmen and the mayor represent District 5. We want District 5 to be seamless as any other city or uh, district. So therefore, I've given you 10, 10 things that I want you to consider and accept. Now here I have the United States Constitution. When it was written, it said all men were created equal. It did not even include you women. We got our rights before women. So what I want you to do, read it, accept it, because when the Constitution was written, it was 10 years later when they came back with the 10 uh, amendments to the Bill of Rights, because government never respect the people unless the people force them to respect. Yeah. I'm a voter. We got many voters here. The election is coming, and we're going to remember. And one thing I want to say, there was a council member sitting right in that same seat. Somebody said this, wanted to cut his throat because he was telling the truth. So we know a lot of things happen here, and I know that bell sound one time. There was a lady in the red up here. The bell sounded four times. You didn't stop her. There was another man over here. The bell rang four times, and you didn't stop. But here come a black man. You're going to stop it, so I'm going to stop <laughs> Reverend Dixon, you still got 30 seconds left. You still got 30 seconds left. Well, uh, 30 seconds. I want you to use the wisdom of Solomon. 
because you cannot use your natural wisdom and do the right thing. It's always right to do the right thing because if Juneteenth is going to mean anything, all people have to be treated right. More people, let me say this one thing, there, there is more hate crime now today than it was in 1885, and I thank you. Thank you, Reverend Jason. Good morning, City Good morning. Council members. I'm Zulima Ramos, uh, zip code 33614. I co-facilitate a local nonprofit that supports low-income residents, have lived in Tampa for 15 years, and am deeply concerned, like the rest of the folks in red and many others, about the state of housing in the city. I've watched countless families thrown out of their homes by the Tampa police and Hillsborough sheriffs onto the street in a global health crisis, simply because it costs more than they will ever make to keep them housed. In 2022, we have to ask ourselves if human life is worth more to you than money, if cut up pieces of tree are really more valuable than our neighbors. As your constituent, I am here in full support of the People's Council of Tampa housing demand letter as well as other demands, um, many that are based upon a successful ordinance in Miami. And if they can do it in Miami, we can definitely do it here with less people to support. Guaranteed legal representation and movement towards the end of eviction discrimination will positively impact the material lives of so many poor and working class renters in Tampa, especially those of color and especially those of us that are both of color and disabled, as well as all of the other things that are against us. The creation of an Office of Tenant Advocacy will help ensure that landlords are simply following all local and state laws. In addition, I'm urging you to invest at least 40 million of ARPA funds into a community-ran houseless shelter and housing first program that is unconditional and not faith-based defund from what doesn't work like militarization and increase of police that are clearly not helping with the houselessness crisis and refund community needs like guaranteed affordable climate ready housing for all residents regardless of their immigrant status continue to create housing that your kids deserve that has organic community gardens solar power and livable conditions that include well-trained counselors and not inept cops that have more of a history of rape and sexual assault than community assistance because I myself have been sexually assaulted by at least one of the Tampa Police Department officers in public. These types of reforms will not end the entire housing crisis, but it will move us in a much needed direction. As stewards in this community, we are counting on your support for the simple community-based well-researched solutions that will help keep our neighbors off the street. Please have compassion for your constituents and the people that live here and don't allow more families to be cast out in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Barita Andre. I'm on, over here on behalf of Madison Highland Apartments. They went up on our rent hundred and eleven dollars the one bedrooms they went up on 93 we can't afford it we're all senior citizens trying to do the best we can we all are on fixed incomes we need y'all help and we can't do it without y'all we also know God is in control and he's the only one can make it happen for us so I thank God for that also we also thanking God for the help that he's sending us not only you all but our Florida and R3, they are trying to help us also get the rent uncontrolled. A lot of them gave $932. They tucked it and sent it back to them and told them they want the full $1,043. We can't afford that right now. Also, it's things happening in our apartments where we can't even come out of our doors because we are scared we don't have no security. That's not right. We had security when we first moved there. They took it away from us. So we are scared to go outside. They sit outside but they come right back in to smoke their cigarettes because they're so scared somebody's going to hurt them. 
We done had one that got robbed. We done had cars taken out our driveways where they stolen our cars and stuff. We scared to even leave our cars and not put our alarm on, uh, make sure everything is going on right over there where we at. We all work together over there. We all get along over there, but we can't get along and someone's getting put out. We just got a three-day notice. Everybody over there got a three-day notice on our doors. For what? We tried and we can't do it without y'all. Could y'all please help us? Thank you. Hi, my name is Aaliyah Coleman and I've lived in a series of urbanized communities mainly. Um, and I'm mainly speaking on behalf of single black mothers who have to basically work practically every day to afford housing and rent for families specifically. And a lot of my friends who couldn't come in because they have to go to work to afford rent, which is extremely high at the moment. Um, and it's unacceptable that these people can't afford somewhere to live, and that's a basic human need. And I specifically would like to say, like over in one of the apartments I used to stay in, they're currently having an issue with mold and serious deplorable conditions that most people wouldn't live in and shouldn't have the choice to, shouldn't have the ability, shouldn't be living in that period. And um, um, working here downtown, I actually work in this specific area and I don't know if you guys don't see them, but I've seen people, plenty of people who roam these streets without housing, without food to eat and everything, digging in the trash cans and everything. And it's, it's quite sad to see. I don't understand how you guys can stand seeing it every day. But um, I just personally like to ask, like if these people aren't finding any places to go, if housing is filling up, especially affordable housing, supposedly, and shelters are filling up, where exactly are y'all taking these people as they're disappearing amongst these streets? What's exactly happening to them? Where are they going? Is, are they ending, is anything happening to them? Like exactly that's putting them in a better housing position, a better position in general. Um, but I just have that question as to where they're going. If y'all can answer that for me, whether it be today, tomorrow, or whenever, but that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Pastor Frank William, located 1112 East Scott Street. I think you all ought to know that by heart now, but uh, nobody seen to come to want to solve our problem. They have built a fence all around the church to keep us from worshiping. They don't want people to park over there. Everything is going on at the church. And not realizing that if it wasn't for the church, Tampa wouldn't be as great as it is. But we got to understand, y'all mistreat black folk. Why? I don't know. And who killing up the white folk is the white boys. Going to a different school, killing up little children, killing up all grown people, don't care about who they kill. But we try to be peaceful with all mankind. But y'all don't give a damn about us whatsoever. You don't care whether they shut down the church or not. They done put a fence all around the church. They done broke out my windows. They're doing all kind of things to them. But we're still there. But we just got to pray to God Almighty that will help us to do the right thing. And we got a black man sitting up there on, on the podium. He, he came to the church one time. I, I didn't meet him there because I had another meeting, and he never come back. But you know what? We will prevail. We're going to prevail because God is on our side. And if we got Jesus, we got it all. I don't care whether you like it or not. It don't make no difference. We're going to be faithful to Jesus until we go to the graveyard. Another thing I wanted to talk about before y'all ring the bell on me, uh, 
Y'all got those retention pond. And I found out the retention pond ain't nothing for the, but for the camper to take your property. And that's exactly what they're doing. They got retention pond all, all over in Belmont Heights and Jackson Heights. But you ain't going to see no retention pond downtown. And that's where they really need it. If you talk about ozone, ozone, what is ozone? Nobody here don't know. I don't know what ozone is. I look it up in the dictionary, I can't understand what they talk about ozone. Ozone ain't nothing but trash, and that's what Tampa City of Tampa is coming to be. Nothing but a bunch of trash. Well, we got to understand, treat everybody equal. Treat the white folks, black folks, the Jews, the, the Mexicans, treat them all equal. You know what? We shouldn't be called, we shouldn't be called no African American or black American. We should call all people just so if they're citizens of America, call them America. That's all. I ain't never been to no damn Africa. I ain't never come out of no Africa. I don't even know what black Africa look like. But I know one thing. I'm here in Tampa, Florida. My brother fought in the World War II, fought for this nation. And you know what? He didn't get no kind of respect. They can give less than a damn about it, just like they give less than a damn about me and the rest of the black folks. God bless y'all. Mr. Chairman. I got to get Pastor McGoo. Uh, Pastor Williams, Pastor Williams, before you go, sir, you weren't here last week, sir, but last week I asked our CRA director of the Central, e, uh, e, uh, Central uh, District to contact you or find a way to contact you, see what we could do to help you with that church over there or the surrounding properties of your church. Well, I'm here I, this week. Well, I, I, well, and he said they said they're trying to come, but I, I made I made a perfect perfect uh, plan to ask them to go and look and see what they could do, if anything, to help you out with that grass, whatever's going on. And also, I'm by your church, and I made mention about it that oh, at your church used to be the old Allen Temple. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's where it used yes, to be. So, so I know all about the history. My grandkids go to school right next to St. Peter Claver, so I'm by that church all the time, and it upsets me to see that church in that condition. That's why I made that suggestion last week. So God bless you, sir, and I'll, I'm going to try to uh, get another appointment to see you again so I can go inside the church if I can, like I think Mr. Maniscalco did. Well, I'm here, I'm here this week. Cool. Make an appointment to come down there and see me. All right, sir. And I guarantee I'll be right there waiting on you. All right, sir. Not only you, so bring, bring some of the rest of the <laughs> 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 yes, ma'am. My name is Margaret Petty. I, I reside. Ladies I reside and gentlemen, this is public comment, so please allow the lady to speak. Thank you. Again, I'm Margaret Petty, and I reside at Madison Highlands. Um, I am from Tampa. I grew up in Tampa. I saw old Tampa. I love Tampa. Um, I know that everything in the world has changed, and mental illness has a lot to do with it. And public housing was something I, I never thought I'd, I'd deal with. But I'll tell you, um, when I came to the point where I really needed it, and finding a house, it was, it was a, almost impossible. I was just about to be homeless out of a hotel when Madison Highland gave me the opportunity to live there where I was told that it was safe and that, um, of course, it was affordable. And um, like one of my neighbors was saying, it had security. I was there for five weeks before my car was vandalized. Um, about two weeks later, I had money stolen out of my apartment. There is no security. There's surveillance. So we can see who did it after they did it. And as far as um, safety, yes, we need, we need someone there that can have us feel comfortable just going to our car, because I never leave after 7.30. Um, these are all things that I know you know have to be done, and I thank you for listening to us, because the world today for us has changed, the world today for everyone has changed, and you're having to deal with trying to figure it out. And it's not, it's not black and white. It's not. Um, when, I, when I applied for um, the Or Florida and all this other stuff, I don't know how to use a computer. You would, I mean, the way I was brought up, I should be able to, but I don't. You know, with, with bipolar and, and, and ADD, my brain is all over the place. 
And it's, it's like, oh, well, all you have to do is that, this. I'm, I'm incapable. And then you're dismissed. And I know that they have so many people that are trying to use the system. And for the first time, I need, I'm in the system. And it is broken. But um, I know that I have hope. And I know that I'm being heard. And I know that it's a marathon, and it's not a sprint. So I thank you for letting me be here today. And I thank you for listening to my fellow neighbors. And um, I'm, I'm just sad that the, um, the management company has all the power over the vulnerable, because we are just trying to live. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I mean, I was more, and I tried to sit still and not say anything. Uh, listening to everybody, looking at all of your faces is so solemn. When the man spoke about Juneteenth, there was no reaction. Um, you should be really, really upset listening to the people crying, hurting. Kent, the young man, could barely talk for his experience. This is not just a, this is something that uh, has to be done. It has not. It's really being a slow movement. As the person spoke about church, everybody sees only by the once when the election time. None of you come back in the neighborhoods. Nobody knows exactly what it looks like. And you're sitting here like you say, okay, this is my job today. You know, that's like the public defender. They have so many things in the caseload they just going through. They don't help anybody. And nobody cares whether they do or not, so the people go to jail for nothing. Yep. These people are suffering, all of us, not just uh, say myself, but they are really suffering. To look at the lady that stays in the apartments that she was talking about, she's going to be speaking in a few moments. Two dollars left out of her check. She has two more weeks for before her next check comes. I don't know if it comes once the end of the month, or I know Social Security come at different times. These people are suffering. Your faces are so solemn. It looks like you have, don't even care. You're just listening out of boredom. And this, these are serious problems. The homeless is nowhere in your neighborhood. You wouldn't allow it. But you have them downtown, you have them in uh, West Tampa, and you have them in uh, East Tampa. It's very unfair. When you go home, you don't have to look at any homeless. You don't have to worry about anybody being put out. These are serious problems, people. And they are. Let's the ladies say on the street, and you look and turn your nose up. You already know that the federal guideline does not meet any of these people's needs. The man was talking about the Constitution. The Constitution was not written for black folks when it came in. We were not even considered. This is after the fact, and it was only for the Europeans, white folks, Caucasians, however you want to put. But there, you have to come alive, look, no, and go around the neighborhood. The lady was talking about Supper Springs. They've been fixing Supper Springs for I don't know how long, and nothing has happened. Go through, look at the apartments, look how the street looks. Please, this is serious. You have people on the street, you go to Palmasia, you go all over Base, your Harbor Island, and your, per your area is perfect. Come and look at the real people. Come and look at the people that's hurting <coughs> in tears. And you see people all the time standing here about to cry. It's time to wake up, not visit churches, only election time. Come out, talk to the public, and see more of what's happening. It's ridiculous how you're making much more money than these people are making. They won't even see it. And they have earned their right for Social Security to work all of their lives and not and have to suffer. It's ridiculous, and you guys should get on the road. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is America Lebron, and I live in Madison, Highland, too. Last week, they put a notice on my door that if I don't pay my rent full, <coughs> they're going to throw me out. Where I'm going to go, I don't know. Well, Florida housing is, um, our Florida is going to help me, but I don't know when they're going to start sending the money. Anyway, the thing is, 
I was living last year in an apartment that the sewage water was going in my apartment. I moved out of there to go into hell. I should have stayed in the sewage apartment because it was cheaper, but I had to deal with the sewage water coming in my, in my house. Now, when I was living there, I got the stimulus check, the two, three stimulus check. My son got a call from housing, because my son lived where I live, and management told him that the reason that we are getting the rent increase because we got the stimulus check. He wasn't living there, I wasn't living there, and these people was not living there either. So what in heaven's name, they had to take our little bit of money when it was, we were told it was tax free. Isn't it tax free, sir? Yes, no, maybe? What it had to do with the rent increase where I live? Because of the stimulus? Did that have something to do with it? Can you guys answer me that question, please? Nobody can answer me that question? Nobody can answer? And, and I, 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 I would like to go there, but we still have some council people that tend to answer people that are speaking in public comment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a public comment. This but that's a public to comment too, sir. Yes, and, and, but that was a question. We tend, we, we tend to have, as our city council, is to listen to the public without yes, any type yes. of rebuttal, without answering any questions. All right. But I thought the stimulus check was free for us. And did that, that is a federal stimulus check. That so was why in heaven's name my management is telling me that they're going to increase my rent because I got the stimulus check? What have to do water apples with, with that? They don't have nothing to do with it. I, anyway, you can't answer the question, so okay. Thank you very much for listening to me. I, 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 Councilman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm please. not trying to get. I, I, I don't. I'm trying to piece, ma'am. Yes. Please, one second. I, I'm listening to what you were saying as I was writing. Also, so were you living? I, I don't know much about the stimulus check. Okay. I don't know if you're going to pay taxes on it. I don't know. All right. If you're a landlord, I don't know that part of it because I don't know what your contract says. I, 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 you know, you may or may not have a contract. I don't know. All right. But when you got the stimulus check, were you living at the place you're living at now? No, sir. I was living in the sewage apartment. So now you go to another apartment and, and they, she's hitting they, me they for the owe them more, more, more rent because you got a stimulus check where you're living somewhere else? Yes, sir. I think you ought to go to the state attorney's office. There's something wrong here somewhere. This is why we come here to ask yeah, but you guys. Questions. I understand that what you're coming here for, but what I'm saying is, if some landlord B, which is where you're at now, yes, and you got your stimulus check and landlord A, right, am I correct, but they're not the same landlord, right? No. So how in the world can the guy who individual whoever that's the landlord we, that's what I ask her want something? that you weren't even there when the time you got the stimulus check. Sir, I asked her that, and this is the question that she said, you got the money, so you got it paid. So I figured well, that money was for us. I, I, I want to see that this city council attorney can answer, but I don't think we can do anything about the stimulus check. But no, if no. we can't, I can send you the direction. If, if what you're selling me is incorrect, and I'm not questioning you, if you got the stimulus check and you were not at that apartment complex, right. and they want you to pay a high rent because you got it somewhere else? I don't know if that's, you ought to go to the state attorney and file a charge. Okay then, thank you, sir. Thank that's you. That's what I think. I don't know about that. Oh, I Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't render legal advice to private individuals here, but it sounds, I mean, the stimulus check is a, a governmental program. It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be related to the well, rental payments or that's, that are under your lease, but I don't know what the terms of your lease agreement are. So that okay. would be. All right. Okay. Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Councilman Goods. We, we've been hearing this Madison Heights issue for a while now. Heights. Heights. Highland. 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 Madison Heights. Robin. Robin Madison Heights. You know what I'm referring Highland. to. Highland. I've been over there. I've driven through the parking lot. I've gone down the streets. 
I've asked staff to have the police go over and have a community meeting with the residents in reference to the security issues. I've asked staff to, to get with the management company in reference to your security guard that was there or what's going on with your security issues. I've asked staff to go over there for folks who are having issues with their housing issues to talk to those folks or, or get a meeting with those who are having issues. Me as the District 5 Councilman, I've done those things. I don't control staff. I only can ask them to go do things because staff works for the mayor. Let me make that clear. I can ask them, and I've asked those things to be done. Uh, I'm hoping that they're getting done. I, I, I haven't had a report on that, but I'm going to ask today, and I get a report from the police department, the district major, of have they gone over there, met with those residents, other concerns about the crime, whatever issues going on, and I'm going to, I see Ms. Feely's here, so I don't have to ask her because I'm sure she's writing it down because I want to know, have we gone over there, gotten with those residents who need assistance, who may not have computers, who may not be uh, illiterate, to go over there and see who we can help and who, who we can't and where we can send them to get some help. So I'm going to ask that one more time to staff. I know they're listening. Uh, I've done that three times now. I'm going to ask for the fourth time that we have 10 police department go over there. I've asked our CRA manager to go over there and have a community meeting with the residents to find out what's going on to see if we can address those issues. I'm going to personally email him today and call him today to see what he's going to facilitate that issue because that is a, a point that we have to do and it hurts me with our seniors. So I want to make that clear to the folks that in a senior senior center that I'm going to do that for the fourth time again and ask the administration to please get back at me or when they're going to do these things. So we, you don't have to come here because it's hard for you guys to get here to find parking and do a lot of things because a lot of you are disabled. And I saw the lady in the back, but she was trying to get up and other people to go help her. That hurts me that we have to have this. So I'm going to ask for a fourth time in the administration, get those things done and report back to me so I can be able to give a report to the community. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Ms. Lockett. So before my time starts, I want to re reply to uh, Councilman. Ms. Lockett, this is three minutes of public okay. comment. If you want to take your three minutes to reply or rebuttal no, to Councilman No, I just want to provide him with some information to the question that he's asking. Can you do that after the meeting or write it down? Okay. So Robin Lockett, Florida Rising. Uh, Councilman Goose, I have been in contact with uh, Ms. Travis in the process of setting up uh, services for Madison Highland, getting those uh, pockets together. Madison Highland, uh, we also have met with the police chief and they were gonna, they were supposed to send, increase the service around there. So some of that stuff is in, 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 in the process. Good information, uh, Councilman uh, Miranda, in regards to providing that, maybe it is, this is a uh, state attorney's issue because uh, they're, Price gouging, they're doing things that doesn't seem right and so forth, so that's a big question. Um, this is a civic engagement uh, situation, right? Some of, these, uh, of, some of these people have not been down to city council, so this has been a real interesting journey for me, right? Um, they knew that this was, there was nothing gonna be done with uh, the request, the unan unanimous vote two weeks ago but they wanted to come and sit and listen to the process to be involved to see what the findings were. So this is a real civic engagement. I don't know whether you guys realize that because once they really start to understand how things work and that this council chambers is for them, they're gonna be down here a lot. They're gonna be down here a lot and that's what you should want. In regards to, uh, we're dealing with a lot of seniors there is an issue with parking here. Can't find parking spaces. Now, when they go to the meter, they can pay, they don't have to pay, but there's no, you know, just like on, maybe on city council days, when there's a council meeting, that those things are outlined some kind of way, identified as uh, for, uh, for uh, disability, because there's <laughs> nowhere for them to park uh, anywhere. So I'm driving up Kennedy, and I see Miss America's pushing her uh, walker up the street. So there's, there's something that has to be done there for them to be involved with this uh, civic engagement. Um, the amount of money. The amount of money. And, um, oh shoot, I lost my train of thought and that's easy to do. Um, I wanna thank you guys, everybody for uh, the unanimous vote. I do recognize, I didn't expect anything today 
but I look forward to working with uh, council in regards to getting the complaint registry uh, passed and also the tenant advisory uh, advocacy office, office uh, uh, complete, and among other things. But uh, I thank you for looking at it because we came a long way from February. So I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. And that's all my time is up. Made a point. Did, did, did. No. Councilman Carlson. No, we're not. We still have we still have plenty. And I just saw one person come in that I am suspecting he wants to make a public comment. But we still have people that are online. Do you want do you want to make your comment? Okay. <laughs> Brother Jarvis, you just walked in. Am I assuming you want to make a public comment? Is that yes or no, Brother Jarvis? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so, so kindly, uh, Councilman Sistro and the City Council. I just want to say that uh, there's a new wave of activism that's coming into this community that, uh, as elected officials, I think you need to pay attention to. Uh, Florida Rising has been able to organize people and make certain demands. And you know, elections have consequences, and politics is, uh, is a serious matter, but it's about serving. It's about serving and about listening to the people and see can we make some concrete changes. We want to go down in history saying that when I sit on city council, I can look back and say these are the positive changes that I uh, did and supported that affected our community in a positive way. This town is a great town, but we have to stand up and accept the responsibility of great leadership. And we have to understand that leadership be independent thought and doing what's good for the constituency and doing what's good for the people. Thank you. Uh, Brother Jarvis, Brother Jarvis, most of us know you and most people know you, but please state your name for the record. Oh, thank you, sir. Jarvis Delamine, community organizer, love this town, been in here over 35 years. Thank you, Brother Jarvis. Thank you. Is there anybody in chambers that would like to make public comment? If not, we are going to go to the call-in. Do we have Mr. Soto on the line? Mr. Camila Soto. Uh, good morning, uh, council members. Yes. Uh, council Attorney Massey and Madam Clerk, my name is Camila Soto. I am a neighbor of Mr. Savitt, who spoke earlier today uh, regarding the flooding issue that's occurring in our neighborhood. Wanted to elaborate a little bit more on that flooding issue. Uh, there are two main contributing factors that are occurring um, that are causing, I think, an exacerbation of the flooding. I'd like to bring them to your attention in case they, they're not on your radar. Um, there are development conditions that the city of Tampa is putting on new development that require asphalting of alleyways, um, sometimes the whole alleyway, when a particular new build is accessing a city of Tampa right of way. I have found out that no civil engineering or stormwater engineering uh, is required in the analysis of the asphalting. Um, the other contributing factor that I found out is that when new pools are built, the overflow of those pools are directed or, or indicated to go into, I guess, whatever drainage system there is, but then also they direct whatever overflow the system doesn't capture into the city's alleyway. Now, I know development is, is, is inevitable, uh, but in order to have development, we need to have responsible development. And so the other factor is that we lack stormwater infrastructure, any of it, uh, around our neighborhood. And so those two issues I've brought to staff's attention uh, I've been bounced around more than Jackie Chan in the movie Drunken Master. Um, I have not been able to get a response because I've, I've been bounced around enough now that I know that stormwater engineering needs to make a call. They need to evaluate the flooding situation over in our neighborhood and do the right thing and install stormwater infrastructure into the alleyway that they're basically making folks do things for, but the city has not done anything with. I think it's absolutely irresponsible, it's negligent, and it's just exacerbating our flooding issues. So I, as a property owner, I'm having to expend a significant amount of money to upgrade my drainage system in order to mitigate now the additional flooding that I'm having to capture on my property. An example of, of, of a very recent rain event occurred on June 2nd, which was just this month, from June 2nd to June 3rd. We experienced, uh, and, and on my property, at least a 12-inch rise in flood. 
that's incredible. That's not even a hurricane. It was just a very intense, short rain event. So my ask is we need stormwater infrastructure. And I'd love Mr. Al Hole to respond to my emails and indicate what needs to be done. Because I've corresponded with him via email, just haven't gotten any responses. Corresponded with staff, been bounced around. So I'd like to see stormwater infrastructure put in that alleyway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soto. Is Ms. Soto on the line? <coughs> Ms. Soto, if you're on the line, please unmute yourself. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Arlene Soto, and I reside at 105 West Francis Avenue in Tampa Heights. And I'm here to support and request um, immediate action on that same alleyway referenced earlier by Mr. Soto and uh, Mr. Savit from 104 West um, Amelia Avenue. Um, we are neighbors and our properties are being impacted with the same, my property is being impacted with the same level of flooding that was just referenced by Mr. Soto. Um, the alleyway is located north of Francis Avenue, south of Amelia Avenue, east of Highland Avenue and west of Tampa Street for reference. Um, again, that alleyway <clears throat> lacks uh, proper storm, stormwater infrastructure and the city has been approving additional development and there is no interlock or engagement with the stormwater infrastructure department to address the flooding issues that have been incredibly increasing since the new development projects or pool additions continue to be approved. So my request for the city council here is to support our neighborhood and facilitate with the city of Tampa to look into this alloy immediately and have the city work with stormwater department and include improvements to address the flooding situation to prevent risks and further property damages. We are all aware this is hurricane season and it's only a matter of time for the majority of the block to be damaged and flooded again. Um, so we are incurring an additional cost to protect our properties, but we also need the city to address this and do their due diligence. Thank you for your time and your attention to this matter. Thank you. Ms. Makinson Surin? Nope. Ms. Stephanie Pointer? Ms. Pointer, if you're on the line, please unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Sorry, I was listening to the TV, not to the video. Um, first of all, Suling, happy birthday. Um, we think you're fabulous. Um, number 67, I want to briefly address this tenant advocacy program. I thought that this was discussed when the rental registration was put to bed. And on October the 28th of 2021, item number five on that workshop agenda said that there's, that would be um, put in place at that point in time, approximately 10.30 a.m. during that meeting. There was a discussion about um, a reporting system. So I'm trying to figure out why are we doing this again or why wasn't it started already? Just curious. Uh, number 58, wow, we can talk about CFI. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I'm surprised because I don't think that the Fludra has complete, has had second hearing yet, but hey, I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one at city council. Um, in 2005, there was a study done for South of Gandy and it said that there was supposed to be a red light put in at Tyson and West Shore. Here we are 17 years later, we still don't have it. But we have doubled the dwelling units in our community. While we, the city needs more dwelling units, when we started on this uh, tirade about the housing south of Gandy, um, we weren't in a housing crisis. But we also have a comprehensive plan that says that we are not supposed to have more housing south of Gandy. Why? Well, because it's a dead end anyway. But um, the nice part is that uh, Southeastern has decided to purchase the, the land for CFI and they would like to get some help from the city to get our uh, get us a public park. Now, I have pulled the FY 2022 budget. There's a seven million dollar allocation to extend Tyson from West Shore to Manhattan. We don't want it. The people who live here really think that's a stupid waste of money. So let's apply it to the money for the park that we're talking about. 
and the red light and the infrastructure, sewer, water, blah, blah, blah. I'd also like to point out that two of the five or six apartment complexes are already pulling in $2.6 million a year more in tax money than they were pulling in before the apartment complexes were put in there. So why not reinvest some of that money? I think I recall two weeks ago being up here talking to you guys about how we are going to have all, all this school money come in and it's going to go out of our neighborhood. We just want a little bit back. Um, you know, we don't need the apartments in our area because, but they're coming. And then we've got folks in CRAs who can't get enough housing to save their lives. I don't get it. Why don't we send some of these folks to the areas of town where we need the housing and where there's land for the housing? But hey, what do I know? I'm not a planner. Over 4,000 units in six years. We have 3,500 single family homes. We have 22,000 people who travel through our community every day to go to work at McDill. Please take this into consideration. Have a good day. Thank you, Ms. Pointer. Is Mr. Kilmartin on the line? Mr. Kilmartin? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey, this is Robert Kilmartin. Thanks for uh, having me on here. I'm just going to add to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Soto and as well as Mr. Savitt. I live over at 106 Amelia, which again is the flooding alley issue. I uh, just want to touch on a couple of things that were brought up earlier in the meeting about uh, you know, a lot of danger and warnings on flooding. And we have to prepare ourselves and a lot of talk out there from folks that have been in the community a long time about diversity. Uh, the neighborhood is very diverse. Uh, we have folks that have lived in the neighborhood for 40 some odd years. Majority of them are African American. This is an alleyway that people utilize constantly uh, as far as walking through as, as a you know completely legal shortcut. And at times, again, what uh, Camilo Soto stated, uh, just a, a heavy rain pour that we had about a week or two ago. It was so untenable. It was uh, even a vehicle could not drive through the water. Uh, therefore, how is someone uh, who is walking through with their children or riding their bike through that alley, how are they supposed to do that with water that would be, you know, almost at their uh, knee level? So essentially, what I'm asking is, to, on top of what they're asking, is just some type of research on infrastructure or a conversation. When you have someone like Mr. Soto who has sent countless emails and is being bounced around, that's not acceptable. This is something again that is an infrastructure issue it's not a social issue it's not a political issue it's just simply infrastructure so we need to have some type of response to this for ourselves and for other people in this neighborhood again that need to travel through this is a serious issue especially with hurricanes coming uh, again we have not had a hurricane we've had some strong rains so if strong rains are stopping that alleyway from any type of travel which is the main artery through that that's our main entry to and from folks' driveways. In addition, with a hurricane coming, um, it's gonna be absolutely catastrophic for those folks. In addition, uh, there's probably six to seven people that live in Mr. Savitt's complex, and those folks can't even leave their back of their house or their driveway to even walk out uh, because of the water is filling up so heavy. Uh, Mr. Soto, and I apologize, I don't know the exact amount of money he spent, but even as we speak, there's a crew of about five people there laying down rocks and attempting to help him to fix it. He's already purchased a sump pump. These are all things that the city is blowing off and not paying attention to from an infrastructure standpoint. It shouldn't be up to a private citizen, especially private citizens in that area that are underprivileged or don't have the finances to sit here and keep piling up gravel and everything else so that they and their children can make it to the bus stop. Uh, again, this is Robert Kilmartin from that Amelia Ave, Tampa Ave, Alley area, and that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Mr. Randolph. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Randolph, and I'm with the West Tampa uh, CDC. Yesterday, a 16-year-old was shot. On July the 10th at 7 p.m. online, we're going to be giving them a meeting. Why do they kill? Why do they kill? An intergenerational approach to understanding the killing. 
The, the program is called to call Health, Public Safety, and Community Development, connecting the dot to reducing street violence. Couple of things that we're going to be talking about. The first is Safe Street. In Baltimore, over 120 people have been killed so far. Yet, an area where they had the Safe Street program is anywhere from zero to 40% down on the number of murders. The Center for Disease Control is using this as a best practice. In Chicago, they had this group called CISPAR, in which they actually go to the hospital when a person is shot because they know from the first 24 hours, retaliation occurs. So they go to the hospital to intervene to try to, to squash the beat. 11 years old of killing. In Chicago, they had this group called Ex-Con for Society, in which inmates have gotten together to come back and take, to take the streets. When it comes to killing in the streets, the streets control. Now, Councilman Goose, the mayor, and the chief of, Pol the chief of police will tell you, they don't control the streets, the streets control the streets. They just maintain it. That's why we designed a program that's designed by the street, developed by the street, and controlled by the streets. The summer is coming, and the killings are going to go up. As much as you see those people crying out there to stop the killing, it's not reaching the right people that you need. Again, this meeting right here would begin to talk about how do you really stop the killing? The streets control, therefore, we must design a program in which the streets stop the killing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Bennett. Ms. Bennett is not Care, on the um, line. Oh, I'm sorry, Celine, go ahead. I'm sorry. Nor is Jean Strohmeyer, but I do want to put it on the record that Ms. Strohmeyer did email me stating that she would not be able to speak due to conflict, and she emailed um, her concerns, and I have forwarded to all you council members. <coughs> Thank you very much. Anyone else in council chambers that wants to make public comment? If not, we will go on with staff reports. Councilman Carlson. Just, to, just for anybody who's here <clears throat> for the first time or anybody who's watching for the first time, um, as Mr. Chair said, the rules of city council are that during public comment, we're not supposed to ask questions. We're not supposed to respond to questions. We're not supposed to make statements. And if you see us, look frustrated up here, have blank stares, probably it's because we're all frustrated that we can't say anything. And um, it's not that we don't want to say anything, it's that that's city council rules. And sometimes some of us break the rules because we feel compelled. I think we would all like to respond to every person in public comment. However, I want to let everybody know that we're, um, we're available all the time to meet with constituents. And, it, and I've, my office has met with several of you. We can't meet together because of sunshine, but we can meet with you individually. Uh, Ms. Lockett set up a meeting. I met with four or five of her colleagues, and we can we can meet and have conversations about all of that. So, uh, please, if you all have conversations, please please talk to us. The other thing I want to let you know is, um, even though several of us represent different parts of the city, I represent South Tampa. I spent so much time in East Tampa that I've been criticized for being in East Tampa too much, and I still want to spend time there. And the reason we go to these other parts of the city, I want Orlando Goods to come to South Tampa because we vote on issues throughout the city, we need to understand it. Uh, so please continue to, <clears throat> to talk to us. Um, <clears throat> just to give you an idea of how powerful the public is, I don't know if Angel is still, Angel Angelo is still there, but about five years ago he came before, he and others came before um, uh, the Charter Review Commission. If you include Morris, five of us were on the Charter Review Commission listing the public. We included, we expanded the, the, uh, the categories uh, of protection in the community. We also, among other things, added implicit bias training. Angel, I want to let you know, a month ago, I sat through the four hours of implicit bias training. So at the PBA at the time asked us not to single them out. And so we, we expanded it to cover everybody in the city. And so every single employee, including us, are sitting through it. And it's not perfect, but it's a lot better. I just want to ask you all, and, and everybody, thank you all for your activism. We're bringing people here today. I want to ask you, please include the mayor in your act, uh, uh, discussions because the mayor controls the staff and the legal department, and we can't get anything done unless we can uh, have collaboration there. 
The same thing with the county. The county has a much bigger budget than a city. The state has a budget. The state also preempts us from doing certain things. The federal government has a much bigger budget. And please don't forget the Tampa Housing Authority, which controls a lot of the stock of the, um, of the affordable housing. Um, uh, you may, as you're watching, the, if you watch the agenda overall, there's not a lot of budget that we have wiggle room with, but there are things that are going through like a $108 to $200 million project for a new office on Hannah Avenue. Think how many uh, affordable homes could have been built with that money um, had we been able to stop that. City Council was not able to stop that project. Um, there's a project that's going through the water department called Toyota <laughs> Tap that could cost anywhere between $2 billion and $6 billion. It's an enterprise fund, so we can't use the water department funds for affordable housing. But if the city staff and the administration spent as much time working on affordable housing as they have toilet tap, we would have solved that problem by now. This city council listening to listen to the public has been working hard for three years on affordable housing, um, inclusive economic development, and other issues on inclusive economic development. We've been fought by the community that wants to just subsidize big companies coming to the area. They don't want to work on inclusive economic development. There's a lot of things that we could do to work together. Um, there, are, there are CRAs in downtown and channel district. We could shift up to 10 or 15, 20 million dollars a year from these areas that don't have slum and bite or poverty and move them to the areas that do. But we need your support to do that. The last thing I'll say is while we've been trying to implement all these new policies, listening to you all for the last few years, um, we found out last fall that, that from the Tampa Bay Times that there was a program that's been called now Renting While Black, uh, which was evicting people out of their homes without due process. And, um, and, the, and the Tampa Housing Authority was uh, part of that. Um, this city council worked closely with the interim police chief, uh, Ruben Delgado, to end that program. Um, and then it turns out a month ago or so, we found out that the United States Justice Department, at the request of the ACLU and NAACP, came into the city of Tampa, sent the mayor a letter in December, uh, and now they're doing a civil rights investigation of the city. But we, city council, only found out six months later. So while we are trying to push these policies forward, we need the collaboration and cooperation of the, of, the, of the administration. But in the meantime, the administration is being investigated by the United States Justice Department. So please, we need your help. There's a lot going on in this city. There's a lot of multiple government agencies. We want to collaborate with you. Uh, please uh, set up meetings with this individual. We'd love to meet with you. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure what I'm heard is correct, and I needed an opinion from the city, one of the city attorneys. Can you use enterprise money for general fund? You cannot use enterprise money for other things other than what the enterprise money is out Thank you very much. Councilman Hurtak. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I echo with what Councilman Carlson said, specifically that one of the things when I got this position, I thought, great, you know, I can do so much. Uh, yeah, and Councilman Gooch just laughed because what, we're, what I'm finding is that th there's just, it takes so long to get something done because we don't necessarily have all the power. The state has gone and preempted so much. So we're sitting up here and it's not that we don't care, it's that we are working feverishly we're, I mean, I, I'd like, we, we are working behind the scenes to try to get something to work. We do care. Um, I think some of this preemption happened so, so many years ago and we're not seeing the impacts until now. So we wanna try to do, th do things about housing, but the state preempted us years ago from going in to anything that's, the, any apartment complex that's five or more. And it's the, the frustration is certainly felt by us. And I, I want you to understand that we do feel that frustration and we are, we're, we're doing what we can. And I do want to let you know that we're not going to stop until we find some solution. Uh, no is not an option. So we are working. It's unfortunately I'm finding and uh, it's just takes longer. So I appreciate you coming out. Every time you come out, you bring more attention, and that's exactly what we need, and we appreciate your voice. Councilwoman Hurtak, thank you for articulating the point that I've been trying to make for at least the last three years of it's not our hands that are tied, it's your hands by the state of Florida. We try and do as much as we can, but when we are preempted, Please call your state representatives. Please call your state senators. 
Councilman Miranda. One more thing, and I'm not trying to make news, but when you look back, I'm not for everything and I'm not against anything. I got to listen to everything that's done. And when you look back and you see one entity in a sports arena trying to play your city against another city, look out, because what they want is money out of your pocket. And I'm not saying that I'm against anybody moving somebody, any sports you've been if you wants to come to Tampa, come. But pay your own damn way. Don't ask for public money to build you a stadium. Don't ask for public funds that every time you have an event costs you $250,000. Listen to what I'm saying. Don't ask that all these times every time you have a concert and the sports authority to want to make some money so they can continue functioning as a representative of the people for the first $2 million go who? And their pockets. So you're getting a zero for the first two million and half of that after that because the other half goes to them again. You have to be aware, and I may not be here. At my age, I'm living on borrowed time, but I'm so happy that I'm 18 years old backwards. <laughs> I made it longer than what I'm supposed to be. So what I'm saying is I want you to be understand how this whole system works. It moves and shakes and rounds and you have to keep track of what's going on. When somebody comes and tells you I want to build something, but I need your support, raise your hand if you pay ad valorem tax at the end of the year. All of us do. You ask, tell me how much they pay, I'll tell you. Nada. Zero. So what I'm saying, open your eyes, open your ears, and understand what's coming. In 96, there was a vote cast in the city of Tampa and Hillsborough County for half penny sales tax for work for the roads and public affairs and needs and the school system to have their money to have the best education for your kids, my grandkids, and everybody's future. And that failed. The same year, they had the same tax bill on for September. They spent $484,000 against the public. What number? Zero. And it passed. Forty-nine. 51. Why? Because they admitted a two thing to say if we built this, we'll get the tax. And that's what happened. I'm not anti anything. But I want to make sure that when it happens, this guy paying the tax is not going to be on the hook. They can come and build any Taj Mahal they want, but pay for the damn thing. Don't come and tell me about creating a new CRA because I've said it and another council member said it. We're not voting for another. So don't come and tell me, and I've been saying it now, this is the third time I'm going to say it. Two words, development rights. What that means, that if this paper belongs to you, the taxpayers, and it's worth a dollar, for the next 30 years, whatever the value is, that goes to them. What a country. So they're going to pay you their 50% back of the stadium with your own money. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just very, very briefly, I want to echo something that others have said as well, which is that we're, we, we meet individually. I, I believe I'm meeting with Ms. Lockett um, uh, this coming week, if memory serves me right, but I'm glad to go out to the community um, and, and whatnot and uh, meet with residents personally. Uh, I, I don't directly represent that area. Councilman Goods works very, very hard for that community, but I, I, if, if folks want to talk in person, I'd be you know, uh, more than happy to do so. Uh, but what we see here really is the effect of what I've called and what many people call uh, a war on the middle class and those working so hard to get into the middle class. We have inflation of almost 10% nationally. We have 30% increase in housing costs in the Tampa area. We have $5 gas. Uh, it's getting tougher and tougher and tougher. And the middle class, the working class, and those who are struggle, struggling to live paycheck to paycheck every week are taking tremendous hits in our city and throughout this country, and that's what we're seeing. But I, I do assure you all that we're all working very, very hard in that in our jobs, uh, and, and we're one of many. But just wanted to contribute those thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, let's move on with our staff reports. Uh, we will not be hearing from administrative update, but if we could, let's start with item agenda 12. Thank which, you, Chairman. Which is PW 22 75191. Thank you, Chairman. Gene Duncan, Administrator for Infrastructure and Mobility. We appreciate you pulling this item this morning. We wanted to shed a little bit more light on it, being that there's been some interest expressed by the uh, neighborhood of Sunset Park 
and with good reasons and frustrations as well. This particular item is a takeover agreement uh, for the defaulted situation we have with American Pipeline, who started this water main replacement project in the Sunset Park area and defaulted about a year after they started. So this action today will, will um, allow the insurance company, the Frank and Muth Mutual Insurance Company, to work to secure another contractor to continue the work that was started uh, and finish the water line replacement and associated work that goes with that um, in that neighborhood. So we also are expecting the surety company to complete the work with the remaining funds, which out of about 3.8 million, there's about 2.5 million remaining. <clears throat> Our CAD team has been out in the neighborhood talking face to face with residents about the situation. And after this transaction today, we plan to send out a letter to all the residents to give them an update on the situation. We will also make sure they have our contact information for any concerns they have about any situations they're seeing in the roadway that are, that are of concern or a safety issue that we need to go out and further button up to make sure we're, we're keeping things safe until we get a new contractor. The main interest of the um, citizens that we've heard, and I know Councilman Maniscalco um, had asked that we take a look at this, is the condition of the roads with the um, unpaved uh, milled roads, exposed pipe, and the future paving condition. So we don't have a schedule we can share with the residents other than the agreement states time is of the essence to get the work done. But we do have plans to restore those uh, roadways that are impacted right now. We have an old list uh, with a map showing which areas will get uh, improved once the work, water main work is done. And so we just wanted to share those extra details with you this morning, even though this item was on consent. Uh, we are fully aware of the public's concern about the delay that's occurred. Uh, which is very unfortunate. We don't have too many defaulted contractor situations, but they do happen on occasion. Thankfully, we have a process in place where we have recourse to correct the situation and stay within budget. Uh, so I'll stop there if you have any questions Councilman about Good. this. Oh, excuse me, Councilman Ma uh, Maniscalco, then Councilman mm -hmm. Good. Thank you very much for that. You, an you answered my question. I know you saw the email. I sent it to you, uh, Vic, and... Uh, Chief Bennett, um, I know you don't have a timeline, but you will be addressing it. You just, I know time is of the essence and whatnot, but you already, you already answered my questions. You're going to be notifying the neighbors. Um, I'll respond by email with this update to the uh, individual that did email me. So that's really it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And just to add to that, Councilman, once we do have the new contractor on board, we will go out and have another public engagement to uh, give further details to the community on the new schedule and any other logistical issues related to the construction. Councilman Goods. Ms. Duncan, how long has this project been delayed? Well, let's see. I have a timeline here. Um, the project started in, um, uh, let's see, October of 2021. They defaulted in January of 2022. They also, the same company that defaulted at the Armenia Bush intersection, if you recall that situation. They're out of Miami. Um, nothing against Miami, of course. Uh, so I don't have an exact date on how long it's been delayed, um, but it's been at least from January until now, six months of a delay, and we expect several months before we get another contractor on board. So. Six so, months plus right now. So saying that, knowing how costs have risen, do you believe with the current dollars, you say it's 2.8 you have left, do you believe you'll be able to fulfill the deal with the 2.8 or will there probably be an escalation? So there, they, the agreement will require that they complete the work within the remaining funds. However, there could be change orders that are, are legitimate and not related to prior work that we could approve. It'll just depend on the situation, but we will not be approving any additional funds or any change orders 
for prior work that was done that as part of the arrangement with the insurance company and while we have this insurance for unforeseen or, uh, circumstances that that coverage is coming on their side and not our side thank you councilman miranda thank you mr chairman uh, I, I believe Ms. duncan this comes under the surety of the bond i'm sorry excuse you uh, this comes under whoever's going to take over that's the insured insurety that insured the bond that everything is going to be done right the contract they insured the insured am i correct I believe so. I might defer yes, to yes. So now Mr. what we Bayer. have yes. is a, a, a party uh -huh. that now has to take over the construction services because they put it now in their lap. They were the reinsured. So now they're the ones that are going to have to take over. And I did see some of that mm -hmm. by accident a few months back uh, on the west side of, uh, I believe, West Shore and the Euclid uh, area back in there. And I saw some of the pipes still open and that they were never covered or anything of that nature. They tried to do something, but they never completed the job. They did the laying of the pipes, right. but they never completed the rest of it. And there was a lot of red flags and yellow signs and all that stuff. But it's, uh, it's a shame this happens, but it happens once in a short period of time because this company now, to get another insurance bond, is going to go through H-E double E hockey sticks <laughs> and, and uh, to, to get the insurance done for their, for their company. So this company, although they didn't complete the job, is going to be very much more difficult for them to get another job because these insurance mm -hmm. companies don't like to lose money. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Carlson. Ms. Duncan, thanks for the update. <clears throat> thanks for pulling this. I also have gotten, because uh, we're right on the border of our two districts, <laughs> I, I've gotten emails about this too. I forwarded them to Vic, and Vic's always very responsive. I appreciate you all pulling this. Um, in your letter to the neighbors, can you please, in a sentence, acknowledge that council has received uh, the comments from the community and then we pass them on to you all and then we've asked you all to uh, you know to work quickly Certainly. that way it looks like we're speaking with one voice is that yes. possible thank yeah, you we the, can certainly do that the, and, and if you want put you know to, our, our the email for all of us to be emailed too but just so they know that 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 that, it, that we're all connected um, some folks get upset because we hand off but city council doesn't have uh, control over staff so all we can do is hand off it but we it, we need to show that uh, that we're all coordinating on it the second thing is that um, as you said the only thing they care about is when is it going to be done and so um, w when do you think that you, is it possible in the letter to put a date to say on this date we'll be able to tell you when it will be done because i think we need to set expectations if it's going to be six months before we know the date of when it will be done uh, in those next six months, we're going to get a whole bunch of emails. So we just we need to set expectations about how long it's going to take. Yeah, we completely agree that schedule is of the most uh, importance and, and interest, but we just don't have the ability to, to um, you know, commit to a schedule or offer a schedule uh, other than to commit that we're going to work as hard as we can to get the new contractor underway so just if you could explain that process and any anything we can do to try to set expectations on the time if they think my expectation if i was a neighbor is that okay you're going to get a new contract and it'll be fixed next week uh, but if it's months we we somehow need to set expectations the last thing is that is it not possible on an emergency basis to get somebody to go in and pave some of these streets just to make it a little bit better for folks well we can't pave the streets until the work is done and the work is unfinished so that's the dilemma. Um, Brad, do you yeah, want to weigh in sure. on that? Thank you. Uh, Brad Baird, Deputy Administrator of Infrastructure. Um, to answer your question, um, uh, Mr. Crossland, uh, the uh, surety will be working to bring a contractor on board. They've already been doing that over the last month, and they've been unsuccessful thus far. They're talking to two contractors currently that we use on a regular basis. We expect over the next couple of weeks to come to terms with one of those contractors. And then at that point, about two weeks from now, we should have a schedule. So it, um, our plan would be at that point to issue a letter to the residents to lay out the schedule. So we can say that much at this point. Okay, yeah, the more detail you can put yeah. in about, about how long it's gonna take will be better. Thank you. So. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> Chair, I think Mr. Massey wanted yeah, to say something. Yes, I, I was, I was going <laughs> to, a couple of things real quick. I, and, and this is what uh, uh, Mr. Baird and, uh, has alluded to um, in Ms. Duncan as well. We, 
like all public projects, we require that these projects be bonded by a surety company. <coughs> and now that the, the contractor's gone into default, the surety company is now involved in getting a contractor to replace the defaulting contractor to finish the work. That's why you have a bond. But because we have a third party involved, we don't have entire control over the scheduling. That is part of the reason for the delay. And so we had to work with the surety, with the third party. And uh, the other thing is this takeover agreement is the first, the first step in kind of making sure the surety does what it's supposed <coughs> to do and get the project completed as quickly as possible. And you do need to take a vote on this item and actually approve it. So I just wanted to remind you of that. Well, so. Very good sense. <laughs> Councilman Goods. <coughs> Gene, thank you for the updates. I did get that email. That's why when we had staff, I, I addressed it with Brad as well. Mm -hmm. But I did want uh, council to know that on yesterday, I was out driving around my district, I usually do. And with one of the contracts we have out there, we had a uh, big minority crew out there working. And that was very satisfying to see that having in that community, having somebody actually doing the work, living there, that was a big thing to me. And I put that on uh, social media. And so I want to say thank you for making sure that uh, we had the, that EBO, had those numbers were up. Thank you. Well, thank you for those comments. I, I have to give a lot of credit to Brad. He's worked very hard on the workforce development and apprenticeship aspects, uh, as well as working with our EBO office on goal setting. So I'm glad we're seeing some good results from that. So thank you. Ms. Duncan, uh, is everyone finished? Ms. Duncan, uh, first I want to send a shout out to uh, Mr. B-Day. Uh, this same company, as was stated, at Armenia and Bush defaulted on theirs. And Miss Sierra was at my place of work and she was voicing her complaint. Mm -hmm. uh, I called up Mr. Vide. I said, what can be done? And within a matter of two days, the lanes were open for the public. Again, weren't paved, but still traffic is still through there. So we can, we as city council can make contact with departments and make requests. Uh, Councilman Miranda said that this type of thing doesn't happen very often, but now we have two in front of us from the same contractor. How often does this happen? Very rarely. Uh, it, it really is a, a real irregularity, and you see it's the same company. So it's not like we have this with different companies occurring. Um, so, But we are fortunate that we have a great process in place with the bond and the insurance that we have recourse to get the job done, uh, although we do have to endure the delay, which is unfortunate. What is our recourse? And I, I, I hate the word lawsuit, <clears throat> but this is costing the community time, money, redirecting them in traffic. What is our recourse against this company that defaulted, if there is any? So my reference to recourse is a, a, a pathway to get the project finished within budget. If there's other recourse to go after the company, I might defer to uh, Morris Massey on that part of the business. We'd have to look at the contract. There's default provisions, I'm sure, on the contract, um, and, and we could potentially go after them on a claim. Uh, Ms. Hamilton is here. She reviews all those contracts on behalf of the city. If, uh, Marcy, you have anything to add there? Oh, sorry, Marcy. Marcy Hamilton, um, Assistant City Attorney. Um, yes, there are default provisions. I do not have anything to add at this moment in time. We looked to see if um, there had been any filings for bankruptcy. We haven't come across any at this point in time. My understanding that is that this company also may have defaulted on other contracts in the state of Florida. So. I, I thank you for that. And Councilman Miranda. I'm not trying to put fault to the board that anyone from out. All said and done and completed, and some action is taken against this company. I would imagine the only thing that's left of this company would be used equipment. You, you may well be right. I mean, I think unless they have a security company to make take sure over they don't something, bankruptcy. unless they have something. another policy that we're not afraid of, uh, 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 assuming that we don't know where any money or any other thing it might be, or you can't find it. The only thing you're going to find is used equipment. I hate to say that. What, you know, that, that might save the city money on, on big trucks and uh, other things, so. Thank you, thank you all very much. Ms. Duncan, thank you. Mr. B-Day, thank you again. Uh, Chair, I know you're gonna take a vote on this item, I believe. We're gonna do it under um, consent. I asked okay. the, uh, the committee here, a uh, chair on that. Uh, is that all right with you? When we go back to consent. 
And uh, if I could add, uh, the memo that, that we sent in a request that this item be pulled, we also asked to share just a quick feedback to you on Francis Avenue, of which you heard some comments this morning from the public. And I know the council is always interested in having some remedy or response to the public comments that you hear. So I asked uh, Mr. Vide to um, come and offer a few uh, comments about Francis Avenue, if, if that's okay. That's fine, Mr. Vide. Thank you, Gene. Morning, Council. Morning, Chair. Big Vide, uh, Mobility Department. Here to address the issue and public comments that you've heard from the community on Francis Avenue. This is an unimproved alley just west of Tampa streets in the Tampa Heights area. And I'd like to start off by saying Mr. Kilman, who called in earlier, is absolutely right. This is an infrastructure issue. Uh, it's a little more complex, but I'd like to give a background on the same. So what happens is uh, there are sound reasons to provide access to developments off of alleys. It does take pressure off of the streets and there are other transportation advantages. Over time, our standards for buildings have, as they should, uh, changed, and new developments are now built higher than they used to before. And so what happens in alleys like these, you have older developments or houses or uh, other properties that are at a different level than the newer developments. The newer developments, as you heard from another uh, homeowner uh, earlier today, are required to mitigate for their stormwater impacts. So there was a, there's a four unit multi uh, family development on 108 Amelia and they were required to and they did put in two ponds and two swales on property. One of the challenges is over time, how well these things are maintained and do they work? And that's a staffing challenge for inspection and things like that. That creates one part of the infrastructure challenge. Uh, as far as 107 Francis, the pool, I think Mr. Soto mentioned that, and he is right that uh, you know, currently it, the requirement is for it to drain onto the alley, which creates pressures on the alley as well. The other thing that happens with these newer developments, because they're higher, their driveway aprons are sloping, so even though they might have mitigation on property, there is a chance of the water running back onto the alleys themselves. We have an interim SOP that we work with development and growth management and we team on this to require property owners to pave un, uh, unimproved alleys uh, up to a certain standard. That standard is insufficient in today's environment to support in stormwater needs that are required. So in this case, that property owner for 108 Amelia had an obligation to pave the alley, but the city, and rightly so, given the circumstances and current policy, waived that requirement to pave it, because paving it without stormwater improvements would increase impervious surface and aggravate the flooding issue. So this is an infrastructure issue. This is a policy issue where we need to update this SOP to reflect today's conditions. But those conditions to mitigate for stormwater, especially in alleys that are completely unfunded currently, would require significant investment by uh, property owners and developers to mitigate for stormwater issues. So that's a discussion that we will continue to have with our partners in other uh, departments, including development and growth management, legal, and others. So a quick background on some of the challenges and the pictures that you saw of the significant flooding that happened on June 2nd. Because the June 2nd date came up a couple of times. And this kind of goes back to the Red Cross discussion about climate change and severity of storms, and not just hurricanes, but over the last seven years, we've averaged around six events every year of two inches plus of rain in one hour in some part of the city. That will inundate that area beyond our current design standards for stormwater, which are driven by the comprehensive plan, which are driven by other uh, requirements as well. So what I'm trying to say is 
our storm intensities have increased and they're more frequent than they used to be. That combined with depending on where you're in Tampa, whether it's tidal effects or whether it's inadequate stormwater system, as in this case, there is an inadequate stormwater system. The nearest inlet today is three and a half blocks south on Palm Avenue. And we'll address what we're going to do about that as well. But this is putting serious pressure on the city's uh, stormwater systems and our ability, we have an assessment, an improvement assessment that was approved in 2010, and that's help. You receive quarterly reports that show what projects we're working on. The Southeast Seminole Heights project, stormwater project, will add capacity that will benefit this area, but connections have to be made to it to uh, move the water from one place to another. So that's the overall challenge. In the short term, we have crews out there right now making at best temporary fixes by adding uh, milling materials and things like that to improve absorption and drainage and maybe smooth out the surface. We're doing what we can with our operations crew. The long-term capital fix for this alley and then we'll have to assess uh, or understand, rather, what other needs there are in alleys. Alleys are not very well studied or inventoried because there's no funding for them. They're also an opportunity for various reasons, different uh, uh, item there. But so the long-term fix for Francis is going to be to connect the stormwater system from Francis to Tampa Street, which is literally uh, about four or five properties away. That will happen when, as part of the raise grant, FDOT improves the stormwater structures and stormwater system along Tampa and Florida. The raise grant is that uh, grant that we recently won, or rather FDOT recently won, but we pushed for with uh, USDOT. And it connects downtown to north of the interstate all the way up to uh, just short of MLK provides walk-by connections, provides better transit connections, but a key component of it was also stormwater. And FDOT stepped up and added $17 million to their project to improve stormwater out here, and that's going to benefit Tampa Heights. Of course, that will take several years, but between the short term and that long term, there will be a midterm where we're going to have to manage as much as we can on that alley. And I'll, I'll commit to you that our ops teams and our engineering teams will continue to explore other options that I'm not aware of right now. But we won't stop until we find some sort of mitigation out here. But there's a long-term fix that will happen, and in the short term, we're gonna work with the neighbors. Councilman Miranda. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, VJ, for your statement. Everything's correct. And, and I, I, However, I believe there, there's one flaw in the way we do things. And let me explain about the what if. And I'm going to make you the nice guy. I'm not going to be the nice guy in this comparison. You're a nice guy and you built your house according to every rule and every spec of the city's zoning ability for mitigating your own water and so forth. And you have a swale on both sides of the house and everything is hunky dory and you love it. However, you say, gee, I got transferred and I got to leave. So you leave with your family and I buy your house. Now, me or whatever says, you know what? I don't like them swales. I don't know why they're built things like that. So what do they do? They cover the swale. And they plant trees or brushes or nice plants. <coughs> but what happens there, no one knows. Yes, it's in your document, the city. But the problem with that is that do we check those things on a constant basis? I would doubt it because there's thousands of them. That's just my opinion. I may be wrong. So what happens, we're exacerbating the problem by not having a check on the people that on the plan that when you first built your house, it's still there after I sold the house. So I don't know how to solve that problem other than if there's a sale of a house, a city must have to go out there and make sure when that sale is consummated that they be called in just like an inspector on a roof or anything else. Make sure that that house is still just like it was when it was processed and got the building permit. That's the only way you can solve that problem. And I hate to take up your time. You're still a nice guy and I'm not. You are, sir. And you're absolutely right. That is an gnarly problem. And, and 
it's only going to get exacerbated with our challenge with, uh, challenges with resiliency and climate. But that's where we're gonna have to work together across departments to see what's working, what's not, and start looking at other cities uh, that may have gotten this right. And, and you're right, from two to four inches the other day when we had that rain, every day, and I got pictures of it at the house, most every swale or ditch in West Tampa was over, overfilled going into the street. You couldn't see the street. Yep, and, and on that note, in two hours, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. that day, in that Ebor and Southeast Tampa Heights area, we got five and a half inches of rain. That's a 100-year storm. It will inundate any system in the U.S. I agree with, I agree with that. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Biday? Mr. Biday, yes. Councilman Goods. Uh, Vic, thank you for responding. Uh, Madam Clerk, thank you for handing me this. As you know, earlier, since I have you here, you got a lot of this, uh, disabled uh, seniors that were here. I'm glad you sent this to me. And this is this disabled parking inventory within the city. And I, I guess the memo reads, disabled parking is free on council days. So if, real quick, if you could explain that, because I think the, the challenge is, <coughs> what I'm saying about how far they're away from this council building. Yeah. And, and we do need to message that better. In the entire downtown area, in the entire downtown area, if you have a disabled decal on council days, you will not get charged until the council meeting is over. I think there's a time limit on that. I need to confirm what that is. But that, that has been the case. Is that on the website anywhere? It's on the website. Again, people don't often you know, go to websites or know how to navigate the website. So that's on us to communicate that better. So maybe we can work better on that. Yes. But, uh, and I, I do see some of the points because some of the things you saw may have a way to challenge to, to get down. So I don't know if they could be a, we could look at possibly in the future Disney parking lot or Disney area to where we can actually have that for the seniors because the people are starting to come down here and a, a lot of our elderly seniors are coming. So if you can look into that, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Just to add a little bit to that, is, is there a way that we could add that to um, the intro or, or the invite yes. on the agenda? It seems, that seems like a quick fix. Yes, we'll work with uh, Ms. Knowles and her office on the same. That, uh, that would be a, a function with the clerk's office of attaching that information as part of the agenda package. Thank you, Mr. B-Day. Thank you. Uh, as, as suggested by Councilman Maniscalco, and I, I agree, let's go ahead and take number 67 at this time, which is file number CM21-71. 562. Yes, Thank you for your understanding. Uh, Rebecca Johns, uh, Assistant City Attorney. Um, you asked that we um, investigate the Miami-Dade Dade County Office of Housing Advocacy. Um, I have spoken with one of the employees in the office along with one of the assistant county attorneys down there. Um, their office has three members. Um, they basically act as a clearinghouse. <clears throat> they, they basically answer the phone when someone calls with an issue they direct them to where they need to be, whether it's another department in the county or an outside agency. Um, they do not provide legal advice or legal representation. They do not get involved in the issues with the landlord unless it's one of the items that's within their purview, which is the um, tenant rights, excuse me. <coughs> the uh, notice of tenants rights or the increase in the rent so basically what they do is those three people then send the caller to wherever they need to be either inside or outside of the county they have budgeted eight hundred thousand dollars this year for that office it's not part of their housing department they've created a separate office within the county and in the past month they've handled approximately 400 calls um, that is in addition to the emails that they've received 
and the referrals that they received from their commission members. <clears throat> Questions, comments? Councilman Mescalco. Thank you for that information. I did similar research. I mean, you, you know, the, the details are there. I'd like to uh, create something like that here for City of Tampa. I know Miami-Dade count, County is much bigger than the municipality, so I don't know if we need three people or two people um, per our population. Um, you know, we've heard from the public, and, uh, uh, and, and they have asked for something like this, or they, you know, we, we have everything here as Miami-Dade has done it. Um, I know we have a, a Tenants' Bill of Rights. We can include that there. I mean, that's really it. I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear from other council members, of course, but, um, you know, make a motion. Would it have to come back as an ordinance to create this department, or how would we I have to do so. it? I believe so. Mr. Massey. You would probably want to establish an ordinance spelling out the duties of the office, and we probably would need to, to yeah, and also there would have to be money budgeted, they'll have to. Okay. For the so as we go into, uh, you know, it is budget season now, and the mayor will be presenting in August. Um, I see $800,000 here. I don't know what we would need. Um, would we need three people, one person, two people? Uh, how much that would be? Uh, of course, this would be within the, the, the city limits, not a county. Uh, department, but uh, I'll stop there and I'll wait to hear what other council members council say. Heard that. Um, I agree. I think this uh, is, I, I know it'll be harder, but it seems very simple. I appreciate your, your bulleted points. Uh, I would recommend three uh, just now because of the housing crisis that we're in and see how that goes. But I'm, I, in addition to that, what I would like to see um, put into any sort of budget item is a, a dedicated amount of money that goes toward um, advertising that we have this. Um, uh, however we can get it out to, to people to know that they can call. So once, the, once this office is uh, established, we need to tell people it's there. That makes no, that, sense. No, I, I agree, information. Anyone else? Councilman Miranda. Along those same thoughts, how long has this uh, ordinance been in Miami, Miami Dade uh, Tenancy Advocacy Office? However, I want to know the results of what they've done. In other words, if they had, you said, 400 cases up to now, are those cases that they, not the whole 400, because some of them more likely haven't been heard, how many of those that they really saved? I want to know if the program really works. I don't want to spend $800,000 and have three employees and we can't solve something. I want something that's solvable. If Miami-Dade has something that we don't know about and we're finding that I'm 100% with it, that they can save somebody from getting exhausted, that is already exhausted, out of their rental unit within 60 days or three months or four months, what has this ordinance done for the people that are, again, the ones that have been served with notices? That's what I want to know. Well, I can answer a little bit of that. They did tell me that the majority of their calls that they have received, and their office has only been open for about a month, the majority of their calls has been for rental assistance. So then they refer those people to the rental assistance program in their housing department. But then I got to know then in the rental assistance department, do they still have the funds available to help those people? I don't want to pass something that, yeah, there's money, there's no money, there is. I, I have to know something. And, and that I don't know. That that would depend on how much money so is available. I don't want to spread false hope, false hope to somebody who really needs it, and they get another slam in the head. I, I'm sorry, I'm out of money. That's what I want to find out. Councilman Goods. From what you've just shown, the responsibilities and non-responsibilities. This is a pass through. Things what Miami has done. Uh, instead of really creating a real program, it's more or less I'm calling in, you just saying, well, the county is not responsible for anything. We're just going to send you to this particular service over here. And what's the accountability factor saying, what's that going to, is it working or not? I mean, that's what, what you just presented to me. And Mr. Moran is right. Basically, to me, this is a nothing. I mean, from what I'm seeing, what you're presenting to me, and you, you get this from the Miami folks, and this is the, their literature. Basically, this 
and again, I, I, I'm just going by what you presented and what you say you've talked to them. And if all they're doing is picking up a phone right. and just directing them to some outside service, how do you, how do you, how do you manage what's the accountability? That's, that's what I really want to know about. I don't, I don't, I don't see how, how the Miami Dade is really helping the people because to me, there's no power there. To be clear, they do direct them if it's something that the county has jurisdiction over, they do direct them to the appropriate department, okay. such as housing discrimination okay. or the rental increase. So just to be clear, they do handle those issues. Councilwoman Hurtak. Uh, the way, if you could put that back up on the screen. See, the way I look at this, yes, it is a clearinghouse. However, as we are finding out, and as I'm finding out as trying to solve this, is that we have federal agencies, we have HUD, we have state agencies for <clears throat> the apartments that are five and over. We have um, a local code enforcement for the apartments or the houses that are four and under. To me, as a, as a renter who would be in this situation, my expectation for this office would be to help people try to find the place they need to go before they run out of time. Yes, do we need to do more? Absolutely. But there's right now, we, I know we are trying to figure out how we, uh, I know that we're right now trying to figure out how we can solve some of the issues with the larger apartment complexes while how, by working with the state and the county. But right now we don't have those answers. It's not that we're not gonna continue to work on those issues. To me, this is a, an area that, a, a, a space that a, a renter can go to see what their actual solutions could be. Um, I, I, don't, I don't disagree that they need to, to have some type of solution, but if you don't know where to begin, you're, you're really stuck. And I don't want people to be kicked out of their homes uh, because they're taking too much time to try to reach each agency. Um, we could even try to put something, I don't know if it's legal um, or, or how we can make it, so that when someone is served with an eviction notice or a late uh, notice that they get information about this program. Well, I do want to point out that on um, the Housing and Community Development website is the Notice of Tenant Rights, which you approved a couple of months ago. The second page of that notice does have resources as to where tenants can call. I, I realize it may not be as much as you would like to see, but we might be able to expand on that. Um, I have also pulled from the Florida Department of Agriculture. They have put out a brochure that goes into a little bit of landlord and tenant law without providing legal advice. We can also add this to the Housing and Community Development's website so that those resources are there for people also. Well, we were listening to um, a, a lady earlier this morning who, who, who doesn't know how to use a computer, and a lot of our seniors are in that space where they don't know how to use a computer, which is why I think this office is important because you can pick up a phone. But what you sh just showed me is eight different agencies. And while that's good information, people like our seniors or others who just, they don't know which one to call. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that this agency is a, is a good spot for them to figure out the right space. Again, because time is of the essence for people who received these notices. Anyone else? Councilman Carlson. Thank you for doing this research. Um, uh, uh, Councilmember Maniscalco, I think you should make a motion to ask staff to come back with an ordinance in July and then have first reading in August. Um, I'm happy to second that. But um, <coughs> could you put, please put that other slide back up with the duties in Miami? <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> so of the four responsibilities, I think we ought to take the fourth one out. Um, we, we city council and the mayor have supported adding more staff. I don't remember how many staff are in affordable housing right now, but there's a team of people that are working with developers and others to try to build affordable housing. My fear is that if we include that in the, in the responsibilities, that person's going to get sucked into working on those programs and not be able to answer questions of the public. And I think the most important part of this, that this person be an advocate, um, 
and 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 be able to answer questions. This all this all is very complicated. Um, uh, it's hard for for us to navigate and understand all the plate pieces. I know there are experts in the audience who understand uh, a lot of the different places where money is and programs, but we need. We need somebody who can simplify it and, and direct people in the, in the right place. If there are folks who are missing $200 to, in the gap that month and there's a program that would solve that problem and they don't know where to go, hopefully this person will help guide them to it, whether it's in the city or outside. Hey, now we talk. Um, now we talk. And that's, and, and that's the, you know, the big talk. thing. The, the other thing is that, um, and some in the audience might disagree, but uh, I, I would recommend that we start with one person the first year. And here's why we, as as the community has said, and we've said, there's a, a, a housing crisis out there right now. There are hundreds and thousands of people being put out because their rents have gone up so much. We created a rental assistance program. What does anybody remember? What what was the total budget? Four million or something like that. But the money was over oversubscribed, and uh, and we have way more people that want that assistance money than than we have money to fill. And if we found eight hundred thousand dollars. Um, let's say we could provide a thousand dollars per person. If we if we set aside two hundred thousand for the first year of this program and put the other six hundred thousand in re rental assistance, that's six hundred families that might not be kicked out of their homes because we were able to help them. And so I I think eventually we need two or three people in this office. But as it starts to develop, we right now in this current crisis we need to put every penny we can into helping people not get kicked out of their homes. Thank you, Councilor Woman Hertak. While I. Appreciate this the sentiment. I'm uh, and and we do need to put money toward housing. I feel like this actually does enable residents to find those issues faster. So if you have somebody who can't reach, who's calling and can't reach, I I think that maybe further down the line, when when we're not in such a crisis, we could we could pull back on those uh, employees. But I think at least two initially to be able to respond to, because we're going to get overwhelmed. Just look what happened with the RMAP program. People are immediately going to call and use this service, and we want them to. But with the RMAP, once the money was gone, it was gone. This is not going to have money that's going to disappear. It's going. It's a service, so it's going to continue to help people go to the places that solve their problem. Councilman Maniscalco. Okay. Um, one, one, one more comment. Please. All right, you go first, and then I'll wrap it up. I'm supportive. I just want to make sure that this has a little more teeth. Uh, I want to make sure that if we're going to say we one person or three people, that they're knowledgeable of those other programs, not just pick up uh, a phone call comes to and someone says uh, I need to move, and you just send them to another line, and still they, they may not get the right services. I just want to make sure that if we're going to have a program that the people that we have are knowledgeable of these other programs and be able to give them some sound advice or, and be able to get them to the right people so they can get the help they need. I just don't want somebody just to be answering the phone and just transfer them to just another agency like that. I, I just have a problem with that. That's my concern. Anyone else? Councilman Mascalco. Okay, so having listened to the, uh, the comments by my colleagues, you know, folks just don't know where to turn for help. You know, my own mother, how many times does she contact me? Help me with the help me with, because she doesn't know. Uh, and especially, you know, when it comes to something so important as housing, uh, which is a, a basic human right, uh, people are scared um, <clears throat> because, I mean, we see, that, we see what's going on. Uh, rents are out of control. Uh, issues with housing all over the place. Um, I think this is a good thing to do. My motion would be um, that the uh, legal department come back with a draft ordinance, draft so we have time to read it and look at it. August 4th, I know we're on uh, uh, summer break there in July, August 4th, um, under staff reports. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry, if it's, if it's a draft ordinance before that, um, that we budget and I'm saying $400,000 for two people to work in this new office. Uh, I don't know how big Miami-Dade County is. I know Hillsborough County is over a million people. Uh, City of Tampa is right at 400. It's under, it's under half a million people. So I think with 400,000, uh, two employees, and if we have to reduce it or increase it, you know, at least we can
can test it out and remove everything here that you see, but remove bullet point four that says works with developers slash agencies to develop housing opportunities as Councilman Carlson mentioned and leave everything else uh, like that. Second. And it's fun for you all to act on the motion. I did want to say a couple of things real quick. I mean, we can certainly work on a draft ordinance, but the staffing and the budget of that is going to take some cooperation with the administration. So I think maybe your motion ought to suggest that that some that the administration appear on August 4th and, and talk to you about how that could be, how that might be accomplished either now or in the next budget cycle. I think that's kind of part of part and parcel of this. So then I because would that also- needs, That needs to be done by the administration. I would I also ask that uh, our CFO, uh, Dennis Rajero, uh, of course, he oversees uh, the budget and also bring in uh, Chief of Staff John Bennett, uh, who is very good and very responsive, and I know he's a problem solver. And uh, if he would like to make any comments, of course, be included in the discussion, whatever his thoughts are, that um, these folks, you know, look at it in the meantime and come back August 4th uh, when this is presented to us. So we have uh, all the stakeholders uh, included here. We have a motion made by Councilman. I'm going to support it. The way it's written, <coughs> even though in '67 I seconded Mr. Menescalco's motion back on June the second. However, I'm going to stand that I want to make sure that everyone here understands that I got to see results because I don't want to give anyone who's already lost hope another false hope that I'm going to solve the problem, and that's what I'm worried about. Thank you. Motion made by Councilman Miranda, seconded by Councilman Carlson. Any further discussion? No, Maniscalco. Maniscalco, I'm sorry. Uh, any further discussion? Mr. Miranda, since you second Again, it the first time, you want to second it this time? Or no, no, go on. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that way. You know that. Roll call vote. Goof? Yes. Vieira? Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carry unanimously with VR being absent at vote. Mr. Chair. <laughs> just just quick, quickly to, quickly to the, folks, the folks in the audience, I mentioned earlier, we need your help with the other agencies like the mayor's office, the, the housing authority, the state, uh, the federal government. In this case, they're going to come, that we're asking, we voted unanimously. We have the administration coming back on August 4th, so we need your help making sure the administration comes with an ordinance we can pass and with the money uh, to approve this because the, the two forms of government have to work together. Thank you. Is there any more that you would like to well, state? Well, the second part of this item was um, us looking into the Gainesville rental um, permit program. Do you want me to discuss that at this would you time? Like, oh, please. Okay. Um, so the Gainesville Rental Certificate Program provides that a landlord prior to renting a unit must register with the city. Um, they must submit a self-inspection checklist. So they do the inspection themselves. They submit a certificate stating that their property will be in compliance with the requirements of the self-inspection and they pay a, pay a permit fee. The city of Gainesville then has the ability to go out and inspect a property and issue a violation if they determine that the property is not in compliance with the requirements. Um, this is very similar to the rental certificate program that the city of Tampa currently has that um, in October, I believe it was discussed here that that program was not effective and should be dissolved. And I talked to Osea Wynn, and she is coming back in July or August to talk about a new replacement program. Okay. Um, so I, I didn't know if you wanted to go into more detail about that, but that's where they are. Is they're Councilwoman developing Hurtak. a new program. Um, they just passed a new one uh, that hasn't gone into effect yet. Um, were you able to look at that one as well? Um, this is the one that I found, and when I called, this is what they gave me. Okay, um, then I can I can talk to you about that uh, afterward. But the the big the the question, and I've I've called to try to get a meeting with someone up there too. I do, does this only deal with the properties with four and under, or does it deal with the properties that um, 
that are the the larger complexes this being Gainesville or this yeah, city? theirs 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 appears to deal with everything so how did I would love to know how that happens and how we can do that. We, we're, we're researching that issue and we're coming back to you, I believe on July 14th, to talk about what we potentially can do. I think that the legal department is working with other, and looking at what other cities are doing at this point in time to see how we can effectively do more than what we've historically done because of the preemption issue that was identified. So okay. we're working on that right now. That, that will be coming back to you on July 14th on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Into item number 56, file number T, 2275263. Uh, good afternoon, uh, City Council. Brad Baird, uh, Deputy Administrator of Infrastructure. I am very excited to uh, present to you a proposal uh, with uh, David Nelson Construction Company uh, pertaining to the Forest Hills Park improvements for $4.2 million. I would can, like as, to... I'm sorry, as, as we're leaving, can we do that very quietly, please? Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Um, yes, I would like to thank Councilman Vieira, the Parks and Recreation Department, uh, the Contract Administration Department, has been a lot of hard work to bring this before you today, and I appreciate all the all the effort on that. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Any comments or questions? A motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Carlson. Roll call vote. Carlson. Yes. Goose. Yes. Vieira. Maniscalco. Yes. Miranda. Yes. Hertek. Yes. And Citro. Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Vieira being absent at vote. Thank you. File number, uh, excuse me, agenda item number 57, file number PW2275-0007. Yes, this is an item uh, accepting a proposal of coming in rude bits uh, to uh, construct executive park gravity sewer replacement for the wastewater department. And I have written a memo on it and I'll uh, entertain any questions. Any questions? Second. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Roll call vote. Goots? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Vieira being absent at vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item agenda number 58. File number CM2172024. Ms. Feely. Good afternoon, Council. Abby Feely, Deputy Administrator, Development and Economic Opportunity. Um, item 58 was a motion to provide a uh, report on the um, CFI, the elimination of the public risk associated with the chlorine plant. Um, I believe through some matters over the past few weeks, you've come become aware that CFI was sold um, at the end of December 2021. I believe the deed was recorded at the end of May. Um, and also that even in some proceedings that you've uh, participated in, that um, the one Fluger proceeding had two alternatives, one if CFI remained, one if CFI was removed, and that developer in fact took out uh, the alternative if CFI remained, acknowledging that CFI was purchased and will be removed and that development will not be constructed unless it is done so. So um, there is a lease right now uh, that I'm aware of through December of 23. And at that time, it is intended that CFI uh, would remove operations um, from the property. Uh, I believe also that Ms. Batzel a few weeks ago um, testified that some operations have already started to move from that site. So at this time, I do not believe that any further discussion on any acquisition related to that would be necessary. But I'm here for any additional questions, and Ms. Wells is here as well. Councilman Miranda. The, the only thing I'm going to ask for this, Abby, is uh, whoever the buyer is, I guess they came up to some mutual agreement on some price with CFI. It has to be. But then you're going to have an enormous amount of money spent on the environmental properties of CFI. Am I correct? Are they going to, who's going to assume the responsibility for that? 
Um, the private developer would. That's I can't that's speak that's to the level that. of contamination. I'm not privy to any yeah. of that information or the uh, environmental status of the property I'm at this the time. Developer. Thank you, Ms. Feely. Thank you. Agenda item number 61, file number CM2274625. That's me too. <laughs> Sorry, Abby Feely. Um, this, um, this was the report to research of creating a program to address the probate issues. I did speak with Councilman Goods on this this week, and I briefed many of you letting you know that, you know, probate is really a private property matter. When somebody's property goes into probate, it goes through that process. Um, and I believe there is some additional information related to that motion that Councilman Goods may wish to share. Um, in addition, I just wanted to clarify one matter that I heard this morning. Um, I did have a call with Mr. Henriquez um, yesterday in preparation for our workshop next week on ADUs. We were talking about some taxing matters. I had mentioned to him that it had come to my attention um, related to the estate properties, um, the $600 million that was quoted. Um, so he clarified for me, and I think it was supposed to be clarified in the WFLA article, that they do a run on the properties within the city that contain the name estate or trust or to know how many are in that grouping. And the property value is that value. Those are not defunct properties that are not paying their taxes. So I want to make sure that we're clear on that. There is not this inventory of... 600 million or 1.4 billion in properties that are are defunct in any way Correct. that is what is encompassed within our overall inventory of properties within the city of tampa proper so um we were going to have some further discussions that really lies in mr henriquez's house i told him we'd love to work with him and coordinate and see what other opportunities there are for ensuring that properties are maintained or that if there are dilapidated properties that could come in, you know, but typically the city receives properties um, that go through the achievement process, they haven't paid taxes, and then they are eventually turned over to the city. The other thing is, is there's an opportunity to purchase a tax certificate if somebody is not paying their taxes, but that certificate has a hold of three years. So even if you're taking that on as a property, that property owner has an option to purchase that back within a three-year period. So that, I don't believe, is going to result in anything quickly changing in terms of those properties. But that's where we are today. I'm happy to hear uh, if there's additional direction or from council uh, that we can continue to work on this with. Mr. Massey. Yeah, quickly, to Ms. Feely's point, a lot of property owners uh, th through estate planning set up trust and they do put their homestead and their houses in the name of the, of the trust. So a lot of the value that you may be hearing as being, you know, owned by an estate or a trust are not properties that are delinquent or dilapidated or you don't even have a living individual who's there and that that's their homestead. So that I did, that, that is absolutely correct. The other, other issue is really probate is a private matter Primarily, so the city, the way the city could enter that is 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 difficult. Um, I mean, obviously, if properties are run down because they are stuck in probate, we could be more aggressive about code enforcement. That's one one strategy we could employ. Um, and and as Ms. Healy stated, if there's non-payment of taxes over a period of time, tax deeds will be issued. Um, it used to be that the city would get a fair number of properties through the tax deed or the achievement process because property owners had failed to pay their taxes and no one else was interested in bidding on or redeeming those tax certificates. In this environment, I think that's probably less so because property values have increased in Tampa and so I think investors are picking up those tax certificates more often than not, but that, that's more of a private investment process than what, than what we deal with. So. What I like to see, I like to see a conversation with Bob Enriquez, uh, Nancy Milan, and maybe the county administrator. Uh, I think we need to look at you have a lot of families, especially in your underserved communities, that don't know the process, don't understand probate, they know nothing. And being in the funeral business, we do we see that all the time. And then again, that property sits there for decades, definitely because maybe Johnny 
He can't afford the fifteen hundred dollars to go down there to file. He doesn't know. So I think it needs to be a, a way to where the city and everyone comes together to where people can know uh, a, a, a call or set up a fund to where those who are indigent who who can't get through that process be able to get in that process. I'm not saying that you take on the legal aspect of going into that person, but being able to have somewhere for them to go, uh, understanding the process, and maybe being able to have a fund to where they can be able to get money to maybe uh, get an attorney or have a, a advocacy group or a private uh, a third party to help with that. I just see that as an issue and a problem, and it's really bad because, again, you talk about code of faith. If that was the case, we wouldn't have all these problems or dilapidated problems in these tabs or some of the places if code enforcement had the staff at the time to do all that. Can, yes. can I also suggest that maybe you add Bay Area Legal Services? They provide free legal services, or and they do have folks that are in it that do deal with probate. That is one of their areas. I called over and they said they don't. I called over and they said I, I, very they do. They do. I, I know that 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 oftentimes they they ask for volunteer assistance in the legal community, and one of the major items that you see that they ask for volunteer assistance is on probate matters. And, you know, maybe we could work with them to help help them if they need help being getting beefed up to deal with that issue. Maybe we can help that. But that's the vehicle typically for folks who can't afford legal services to work through to get that, that, that help. And, so Abby, just, maybe the chief judge, too, because we found a lot of times it takes a long time to get a judge, get to courts, and find out what's that process because maybe it needs to be a probate court order because there's a, there's a long stretch uh at times so i just think that it needs to be a body come together to look at those issues uh figure it out and maybe with some of the tax or whatever it'd be a fund to where you can help those folks who can't help themselves to be able to get that stock back in to be able to live in that home do what we need to do but i just think there's there, there's a there's a missing gap here i want to see how we can fill that gap okay so if you can just bring that back uh you know uh yeah, I would ask for at least 90 days, maybe. All right, that's to work fine. On I, that. I, that, that's fine. I don't okay. issue with that. About 90 days, that's fine. Okay. Bring it back and tell them what we come up with. That way, you, you'll get the time to meet with all parties and so forth and see what we can come up with. Not what we can't do, but what we can because we've got to be able to help the people who can't help themselves sometimes. Understood. Thank is you. That, is that going to be your motion, Mr. Goods? Yes. Second. Motion by Councilman Goods, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. Roll call vote. Sierra. Maniscalco. Yes. Miranda. Yes. Hertek. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Goose. Yes. And Citro. Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Vieira being absent at vote. Mr. Reamer. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the City Council, and members of the public. <coughs> Whit Reamer, Sustainability and Resilience Officer for the City, uh, appearing today at the request of uh, council to provide an update uh, marking the one-year anniversary of the release of the city's resilient Tampa roadmap. Um, I submitted a memo to council. I'm gonna highlight a couple of the programs that are included in that memo, but I'd also like to sprinkle in a couple of anecdotes based on public comment that we heard today. Uh, to show that the city uh, is and continues to focus on many of the issues that were brought before council today. Uh, some highlights and uh, a brief history on the Resilient Tampa Roadmap, if you will. Uh, when I started in this position uh, just over two years ago, the mayor had entered into a relationship uh, that was approved by city council to work with the Resilient Cities Catalyst, a consultant group based out of New York that has helped produce resilience roadmaps for cities across the world. Um, you know, when I talk to peers in my position in different cities, each city has a different definition of resilience. Uh, the definition that we took here at the city of Tampa was all encompassing and included things looking at housing, transportation, workforce development, and of course, uh, sustainability of our built environment. Yeah. Jacksonville recently hired a sustainability and resilience officer, and they are focused solely on coastal resilience, that is protection from uh, storm surge and, and heavy rain events. So every city handles this a little bit differently. Uh, our 58 initiatives that are laid out in the Resilient Tampa Roadmap are a reflection of the mayor's uh, Transforming Tampa's Tomorrow strategy and the five uh, areas that she focused on when she took office. And I think 
that those areas of focus still remain true today. Allow me, if you will, just to tick off a couple of the 58 examples, uh, 58 initiatives that we're working on based on what we heard here today. Accelerate the development of new affordable housing complex uh, uh, um, units. Preserve and restore more affordable housing units. Launch a climate risk education and communication campaign. Address and fortify critical infrastructure. Stormwater systems for a changing climate. We heard uh, from Mr. Vide that we experienced a uh, one in a hundred year storm event last week. I think that's the third one in the last year that we've experienced. These storms are becoming more intense and more frequent and our stormwater department continues to look at these issues in the face of resilience and climate change. Of those 58 initiatives, 72% are on track. 80% of the climate-related initiatives are on track, and uh, the remaining initiatives are still in the planning phases. This is a big deal, and there's a lot of money behind this. In the federal infrastructure bill that was passed last year, there's $47 billion slated for climate-resilient infrastructure. This, this state, the state of Florida, has a billion dollars in the Resilient Florida program. Um, as Funding priorities of state agencies continue to shift to meet changing demands. The Resilient Florida program is going to become one of the top funding programs for stormwater and flood mitigation. That's going to be an extremely important fund for our stormwater department, our mobility department, and sustainability and resilience department to seek. Um, I can go through uh, a number of the statistics that we use to track these 58 initiatives. We use a proprietary dashboard that was developed for the city to help us understand exactly where these initiatives are, uh, who at the city is helping sponsor them, uh, where uh, the funding is coming from, how much funding has been expended. For example, we have over $113 million catalyzed for the Resilience Tampa Roadmap so far. Much of that comes uh, from the ARPA funds and affordable housing, but I can tell you just off the top of my head, I worked with the um, housing department to get a two and a half million dollar HUD grant to focus on that uh, weatherization and owner-occupied rehab program. You heard consistently over and over from the housing advocates the need. Uh, one of the cheapest ways we can provide affordable housing is to keep people in their homes, keep them safe in their homes. This owner-occupied rehab program is an extremely effective program, but I'm proud to work with Ms. Feely's department to bring that resilience funding, that weatherization funding to bear. Uh, we can't do this alone. I certainly can't do this alone. You just heard the breadth of some of these programs. We continue to utilize partnerships, 45 public and private partners across uh, the city and across the Tampa Bay area to help us achieve our goals. Um, and we're doing all this on a daily basis. And I look forward to answering any questions from council. Any comments or questions? Councilman Carlson. Yeah. Um Thanks. I, I said this, I think, to you and, and Chief of Staff last year. I don't agree with the all-encompassing definition of resiliency that includes what I consider economic development and, and, uh, and solving problems of poverty and other things. I understand, <clears throat> I understand that there's an academic view that, 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 that it could encompass all those things, but I think in, in looking at them through that lens, it gives us the, the wrong view of it. So I've had other conversations about all that. But... Um, but the number one question I get in South Tampa is when, it, when is South Tampa going to be underwater and what are we going to do to mitigate that? So um, um, thank you for the question, Councilman Carlson. So, uh, you know, messaging um, the difference between sea level rise and storm surge is something that we continue to work on. That's why we have the public education campaign as one of our initiatives. Uh, storm surge is a, a certainly a very serious issue for the South Tampa Peninsula and in fact is for, for much of uh, the city of Tampa. We work at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council uh, on that type of emergency preparation. Thankfully, Red Cross was here this morning talking about preparation. We have heard through our formation of the Climate Action and Equity Plan that uh, preparedness and those kits that, that um, Red Cross referenced are just a critical element. Storm surge is a, is a major issue, and uh, we have maps that show our new evacuation zones that were released, I believe, two weeks ago. Uh, and so uh, Category 2 or Category 3 storm would significantly impact uh, the South Tampa Peninsula. That's different than sea level rise, which is a slower, gradually occurring rising of, of the seas. And um, the data that we have to date on that shows that uh, 
in about 30 years, we'll have between two and eight feet of sea level rise, depending on our climate mitigation actions. Uh, right now, at the level that we're, we're advancing, uh, it, we tend to use the NOAA intermediate uh, high, and that puts us at around uh, two and a half to four feet um, in the South Tampa Peninsula, which is around 1,250 properties that would be impacted by sea level rise. Of those 1,250 properties, about 80% of them are publicly owned properties, essentially uh, Bayshore, parks, things like that. So it, it's difficult to message that actually we've got some time in the next 30 years vis-a-vis -vis sea level rise. Uh, if you compound more intense and frequent hurricanes on top of sea level rise, the threats become more serious and real. Uh, but I can tell you that our infrastructure department, our mobility department, uh, the work that I'm doing, working with Cass uh, Congresswoman Castor's office to put earmarks in for, for better seawalls and protection, we're doing everything we can to prepare this city for climate-ready infrastructure. We're raising pumps, we're looking at evacuation routes, we're making sure that our pipes uh, are, are up to date and can handle that type of inundation. And of course, uh, encouraging that transition to a clean energy economy whereby we're not burning fossil fuels and further increasing our greenhouse gas emissions. Anyone else? Mr. Robert, thank you very much. Thank you. Agenda item 66, file number CM2274624. Oh, that was taken out. That's yeah. back. Excellent. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, then. Uh, without objection, shall we recess till 2 o'clock? Yes, sir. Let's go. Yes, sir. We are. I'm sorry. We are recessed. Thank you.